Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, this is a super long episode, and while well, I do have other stuff going on in my life, uh, no need for an update. Let's just dive right into it. My guest this time is Robert Emmett Mahar, who has a brand new book out called Albert Camus and the Human Crisis from Pegasus Books. I, um, I came across this one while going through the Pegasus Books fall catalog when they were helping set me up with Robert McCrum to talk about his book, Shakespearean, a few months ago. And I saw this one and I thought, well, that that has to be the same Robert Emmett Mahar who taught me as an undergrad at Hampshire College in the 90s, right? So from here on, I will be calling him Bob, as he asked that we do back in, God, 1992 or thereabouts. So yeah, Bob Mahar was an undergrad professor of mine back when I was a know-it-all and moron uh, at Hampshire. He taught a class on Camus, but I was too dumb to, to sign up for it. I made goofy witticisms about uh, Camus and existentialism, completely uninformed uh, and avoided actually doing the work. Instead, I took a class of his called Sense and Spirit that I'm still wrestling with and got some neat concepts from, but um, we talk about that on the side and in this one really more after we finished recording. Anyway, as it turns out, Bob's been teaching Camus for around 50 years, and he distilled a lot of his learning and reading from that in, into this book. He uses a, a 1946 lecture by Camus, The Human Crisis, to help explore Camus' prescience, the the ways his work has been misread and misunderstood, and and what it means to correctly read him, um, and and just why he remains so important today, sixty sixty plus years after his untimely death in a, a car accident. Or assassination, as as Bob mentions, um, but he does this amazing job throughout the book of exploring and explaining Camus' work, his his writing and and well his literature, theater, and philosophy, and how they all come together, and the background material that creates the the scaffold for Camus' literary philosophical project and and the key influences on on his writing and thought uh, some of which is informed by bob's own background in the classics and and divinity school um the book is only about 200 pages of main text but but it gives the reader a really profound understanding of of what camus achieved what he was trying to achieve uh, when he was well when he was caught short and why he's He's so important uh, to making sense of the post-war world up through today. Now, the book has certainly got me ready to, to dive back into Camus' work. And as I mentioned during the episode, I, I read The Fall um, right before finishing this book so I could have that piece of Camus uh, sort of as a, a background for this one. Like a lot of people, I took The Plague down from my shelf in early 2020, but I found myself unable or or unwilling to, to give it a read, maybe fearing it would be too much like our, our day-to-day -day experience here in one of the, the hot zones of the pandemic. But between this book and my experience with Louis Manon's The Free World earlier this year, I think I'm going to be diving back into Camus in the months ahead, especially now that I've got Bob's book as a, a sort of guide. So Albert Camus and the Human Crisis is a wonderful read. And if your only experience with Camus was was thinking The Stranger was cool when you were 17 or 18, then you really should go explore this book and then reach back out into to Camus' subsequent novels and, and essays and theater. Anyway, um, I will say that Bob and I could have talked about a lot of other topics during the conversation ahead, like his aforementioned classics and divinity backgrounds, his theater work around the world, uh, working with translation of ancient Greek and other texts, uh, the travel guides he's written about Ireland and the work he's done on Irish history. 
and a lot more about his near half century at Hampshire College, where he was part of the founding faculty. But since this one's already almost three hours long, we're going to have to wait until next time for all that. Now, um, as far as caveats go, almost everything that could have gone wrong with this episode did go wrong. Uh, it was a two and a half hour drive up to his place in heavy rain. My tire pressure light turned on 10 miles from, from my destination. Um, so I nervously drove the rest of the way to his place because the last gas station was five miles back. On the way back at aforementioned gas station, I tried filling the tires, but the light stayed on. So I drove another two and a half hours on questionable tire pressure in the rain to get home that night. Also, and more significantly, the main recorder did not actually record this conversation. Uh, I only noticed around the two hour and 10 minute mark that recorder number one was not counting anything. Uh, it was not going. So I hit record surreptitiously to start a new recording session on that recorder, uh, which is the high quality one. Um, and was happy to see that recorder number two was working fine. It was counting the whole way. We were at two hours and 10 minutes and still going. But the problem was when we finished and I hit stop on recorder number two, the display on that one read disk full because I had not deleted files from the backup recorder since pre-pandemic times. It's a standard operating procedure back then, but I've been doing most of the shows remotely. Didn't remember to just take the SD card from recorder two and clean off the old ones that I didn't need anymore. So I had no idea if all of recorder number two's uh, file was wiped out or how much it was able to save. All I know is the disk is the little SD card is, was full. So I spent that drive home worrying that everything I'd managed to record was just the final 45 minutes of this three hour conversation, because that's all that recorder number one captured. And I worried about that for a while. Um, you know, me and anxiety, I... I let these things prey on me. I, I saw on the GPS, it's one hour and 35 minutes home. And I thought, okay, in one hour and 40 minutes, I will know exactly, you know, how much stuff I recorded. Maybe recorder number one caught most of it and it just shut off uh, in a weird moment. I don't know. Um, but then this thing happened about 45 minutes from home when I finally was able to, to transcend it all because it hit me in that moment. Gil, the state is already determined. The file is either there or not there to you. But in reality, that state is already done. Your anxiety about it is not going to change whether the recording survived or not. All you're going to do is find out. And that made me chill out. Tire pressure, notwithstanding. Um, I even stopped at CVS on the way home to, to pick up uh, Halloween candy for Sunday. And then, you know, instead of racing back to, to check the audio files right away. As it turned out, recorder number two covered the first 150 minutes. So between that and recorder number one, we've got the whole shebang. I don't have to drive back up there and, and sit down with Bob and, and, you know, remake this conversation. That said, there's going to be an abrupt change in audio quality uh, around two hours in. Oh, also, Bob's chair squeaks and I dropped my pen at one point. Now, here's Bob's bio. Robert Emmett Mahar is Emeritus Professor of Humanities at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. Before Hampshire, he held faculty positions at Indiana University and Notre Dame. Across his 52 years of teaching, he also held numerous visiting chairs and professorships in the U.S. and abroad, including at Trinity College Dublin and Yale. His publishing career includes over 20 books, translations, and original plays, most recently Heracles Gone Mad, Rethinking Heroism in an Age of Endless War, Killing from the Inside Out, War and Moral Injury, and his latest book, Albert Camus and the Human Crisis. He has offered workshops on the translation and contemporary production of ancient drama at colleges and universities in the U.S. and abroad, and has himself directed productions at such ventures as venues as the Samuel Beckett Center in Dublin and the Nandan Center for the Performing Arts in Kolkata, India. In recent years, he has directed and participated in a range of events and programs concerned with healing the spiritual wounds of war in combat veterans, their families, and their communities. And now, the virtual memories conversation with Robert Emmett Mahar. 
So tell me about where the book came from. Albert Camus and the, the Human Crisis. Where did it begin for you? Especially since you've written about Camus, I think you said about 40 years ago. I haven't been teaching him. I'm answering all the questions here. You should be the one <laughs> telling me. Where did the book come from? That's a difficult question to answer because it, it grew across my life. Um, when I read The Stranger in college, uh, I had never heard of Camus, and I was only slightly um, impressed by the book. Um, I It was a beach day. I went to the beach, thought I should bring something with me to read, and um, and that's what I did. I read it partly on the bus to the way to the Indiana Dunes, and uh, and read it on the way back, and read a little bit of it while I was at the beach with friends. And you know, you can read it very quickly, as you know, it's a very very short book. Um, and I put it down and didn't think about it. And then um, and then something happened. I I have to fast forward a number of years because from that point I went on to graduate school at the University of Chicago. Um, I read a little bit more of Camus then, but I'm not sure what it was. Again, it was very peripheral, and I and I might have read The Plague. I think I read Neither Victims Nor Executioners, which is a very short pamphlet, which is actually just a compilation of, I think it was seven um, articles that Camus wrote for the newspaper of which he was the editor-in-chief, Combat, and, or Combat. And but yeah, none, none of I, these fancy French pronunciations on this podcast. We may as well be ugly Americans and just... Okay, just, you know. okay I can get as ugly as, <laughs> as anyone else on that. The, so I was... Um, after the University of Chicago, I taught for a year at Indiana University, and I was hoping that that's where I would stay for quite a while. But there was a, um, an anti-war movement, an anti-Vietnam War movement afoot, and protests and so on. I took part in those uh, as a first year faculty member at Indiana University in Bloomington. And Indiana University is is a was at that point, and to all I know, uh, still a very progressive university in the midst of you know KKK land. The 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 Ku Klux Klan was founded in Martinsville, Indiana, just just a stone's throw from Bloomington. So the town and gown um, was, um, the town and gown disparity there was a crevasse. I mean, it was, it was, uh, and that was basically true for most of Indiana, that, that Indiana University was, was an oasis of, of progressive, liberal, democratic, um, as all of those more or less converged uh, politics in an ultra-conservative state. So when the university erupted over the Vietnam War, the state legislature withdrew its budget, uh, not withdrew it, reduced it to the level that it was at the end of World War II, and this was in the 60s. So um, needless to say, I'd like to say that I was a a martyr to the cause and that I was let go because of my anti-war protest participation, but in fact it was, they they handled the dismissals according to seniority, and there was no one lower on the on the poll than, than I was at that point. I had only taught there for a matter of six months or seven, eight months uh, when I got my pink slip. So I immediately um, moved to, to Notre Dame University, and I was working at, at Notre Dame in the theology faculty. At that point, I had taught in the religious studies program at Indiana University, and I was teaching in the equivalent in in um, in at Notre Dame, which was the School of Theology, and <clears throat> and the university. Actually, it was a student body council and president who had the budget of the student students government at. 
Notre Dame was astounding to me. Yeah. I mean, it, it, they had their own building. They had their own Senate building. The, um, the president and the vice president and the treasurer or whatever of the student government, they all had private secretaries. <laughs> um, this was, this was a world. big operation with a huge budget. And at that point, um, the students had decided to, to convene and, um, you know, and bankroll an international conference on Camus. This was, I think it would have been around uh, 1970. Um, but um, it was to look back and, and, dis and honor and oh, investigate the death, legacy. Right? It was, he died in 60. This was, no, actually, I think it was probably, it could have been 1970, so that would have been perfect. It would have been commemorating his death after 10 years. And so the, um, there wasn't a, a large Camus following at, at Notre Dame among the faculty. Namely, um, there weren't any courses on Camus. There wasn't, um, um, there, were, were there, there wasn't any member of the faculty who really focused on Camus at all. And um, so the university had to, since it was hosting this conference, this, the university had to have a speaker from, from Notre Dame, from the Notre Dame faculty. And um, I'm not sure exactly how I was chosen, but it had nothing to do with any expertise or actually any particular interest I had in Camus. I think the student body, at that point I had already uh, become very much um, active, very active in the anti-war movement at Notre Dame among the students and I eventually was one of two faculty who led the student strike that shut down the university uh, for a period of time. I was the same uh, other faculty member who was, uh, John Roos was his name, and he's still there, I think, although probably now as an emeritus, professor of government at Notre Dame. He and I were partners in crime, as it were, at, in, in all the various anti-war things, and we, when the, when the students struck, uh, and we were on the, the two faculty on the student strike committee, we decided that the faculty might as well join in, and we might as well at least um, sign a protest for against the invasion of Cambodia. That's what we were at that point most focused on. And uh, we thought that it was Notre Dame's duty, in a way more than it was many other universities' duty, to speak out against Nixon and the invasion of Cambodia because shortly before that, or he, he was asked after his having for you know, a tiresome amount of time, um, said that all the protests that were erupting around him really amounted to nothing because the silent majority were behind him. So finally, I don't know whether it was Tom Wicker or who it was who confronted him and said, you've been talking about this silent majority for quite a long time. Who are they? Can you, can you just give, put a face, put in a name, give any, any sense of who you are identifying as a silent majority. Well, this was in the age of student university college protests. So he said, Notre Dame. Now this lit a match under <laughs> us. And we said, we'll show him. <laughs> no way in hell, you know, are, are we the silent majority? And so, um, so that's what a activated us. And so we were determined to have the faculty um, sign a formal um, indictment or formal protest, um, not only it being called the silent majority, but but to show them we weren't silent, in fact, not at all, and that we were we opposed his his um, invasion of Cambodia, and um, that was a struggle to get the faculty to to sign that, but we did, and so the, when the, the, the university for a period of time, short period of time, was, was, was shut down, and the faculty, uh, by a sizable majority, um, all 
signed a letter of protest to the president, and it was you know it was made public and so on. So that so is an answer, answer to your question. The question <laughs> is that that why how did this happen that I was chosen to talk about um, Camus? Well, I think since this was a student uh, invited invited student designed um, conference. They maybe they suggested my name. I don't know, but I was approached by the head of my department and said, "You know, you you have a, six weeks to give a a lecture at this, uh, you know, a presentation at this international conference on on Camus and his work and his life and his death." And I basically, you know, I had spent two hours on a beach reading <laughs> the stranger and reading yeah. the stranger and. And and you know noted Camus scholars from around the world were going to be there and and um, uh, to speak about his work. So, so I just um, put everything down basically, um, sort of slept my way through my classes. I mean I had to I had to talk. So I was talking in my sleep, perhaps, and just focused on re uh, reading all of the Camus that I could possibly read in that amount of time. And came up with something. I have no idea what I came up with, uh, but I did give this 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 presentation. Apparently, um, <laughs> so you've been told. <laughs> so I've been told. I gave it, and afterwards, um, Germaine Bure, who's who's lecture, she was sort of the keynote lecturer. Uh, Germaine Bure is one of the most uh, was one of the most wonderful, warm, fierce, funny, uh, brilliant people I've ever known. And um, her, her lecture at Notre Dame was extremely memorable. Um, I remember it was the lecture that wasn't ever going to end because she spoke for you know, a reasonable amount of time, uh, an appropriate amount of time, maybe 45 minutes. She took some questions. And some student, God bless him, asked, well, you knew him very well, didn't you? you? It's obvious you knew him quite well. You know, how well did you know him and what? Can you tell us some stories about him? Well, in fact, she, she loved Camus, and, and um, she knew a great deal about him. He was, she was at that time probably the most eminent scholar Camus scholar, um, in, certainly in this country, and certainly one of the most eminent in the world. And uh, but she had known him when she was a quite young woman, um, and he had, in fact, um, recruited his his um, sort of street theater or spontaneous theater students. He, when he was in his late teens, I think, in early twenties, he had a theater group, and they did. Uh, he adapted a number of plays. He translated some plays, and that theater was a large part of his of his life at that point. And he recruited a number of his, um, you know, his actors from her classes. She taught in Oran, where the um, where the plague is set, you know, and and where Camus lived for a while after Algeria, and that's where. And she, in fact, introduced him to his second wife, um, Francine Flore. And um, so, and and I could I could talk for a long while about about Germain. She was a um, a member of the resistance. She was a in the French tank corps in World War Two. She with Leclerc. Um, there are amazing stories she's told me about the, about those. Those times, uh, she then, with um, she then, when Rommel was pretty much driven out of, when the Germans were pretty much driven out of North Africa, and the Allies invaded Europe from the south, um, came up through Italy, and and I believe um, through Marseille as well. I'm not sure. She moved with the French tank or. Uh, which then, I don't know the details of this, but she somehow became the adjutant to a general within a sub-general to Patton as they moved through um, yeah. 
you know, through through Germany, through the Black Forest, and where she um, captured a whole Panzer tank crew, uh, which instead of blowing her up, they decided to surrender to her. But that's another <laughs> another amazing story. Yeah. But you know, but it was her stories about Camus that captivated me because. Um, she just knew him so well and admired him so much and loved him. Um, and of course, as a critic, as a French literature critic, she, um, you know, she, she was extraordinarily insightful, perceptive about, about his writings, his philosophical writings, but particularly his, you know, his fiction. Um, um, so yeah. I, I was just enthralled. And going back to that night, we were there a long while ago here in the conversation. But students were the same way. I mean, they when they, when she began telling stories, they wouldn't let her quit. Um, and she and she, several times she tried to stop. Um, and um, and she, and they said, no, no more. You know, it was an encore. Uh, J Johnny Cash had been there several weeks before at Notre Dame, and yes. he didn't get the number of callbacks. <laughs> <laughs> so, that she got. So, I think she was quite exhausted by the time she left. But there was a wrap up on the last day of the conference, and um, and she came over to me, and said, um, and she said, I really enjoyed what you said. I think it was important or something to that effect. And and I'm actually, she said, I'm a little stunned that a student would be able to speak about Camus, you know, the way you did. And I thanked her, but I said I wasn't a student. Yes, uh, <laughs> being ten years and, older than. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, she, you know, she laughed. She was a little embarrassed. She had no reason to be, but I was. I, I, I had a baby face, and um, and I was frequently uh, at Indiana and Notre Dame, you know, confused with students or mistaken to be a student. Um, and so, anyway, we became fast friends. And we were friends for the next over 25 years. And she used to invite me and my wife to her house uh, in North Carolina. Eventually, that's where she lived. And then she had a home, a summer cottage up in Interlock in Michigan. And, and she just, um, partly at my urging, um, just told story after story after story about Camus. And at that point, I... At that point, it was in, in, in a way an intellectual love affair. She was often she she laughed at the the number of times people had assumed and um, that she and Kimu were lovers, but that was very far from the truth. I mean, she loved him, but she's lesbian, and um, and she had no no interest in in men, not even yeah. Kimu. Uh, and so so that was, yeah, but it was a. It was a lifelong um, friendship for them. She had, in her last time, she spent some time with him. He was, it was not that long before he died. And um, so I was, I was really just um, dragooned into writing about Camus. And, uh, and but the influence of her on your intellectual development with him? That man I was never going to. I was never going to leave Camus. I was yeah. never going to leave him behind. I was certainly was never going to outgrow him. Um, and as I grew as a thinker, as as a scholar, as primarily as a teacher, because that's what I've always seen myself as, um, I um, I took him with me, and he grew. My appreciation of him um, grew as I grew, because I think I was able to. To, to appreciate more and more what he has to give and give over and over in, in a life, especially in our times, especially the, the um, there hasn't really been any peace uh, in the United States, uh, domestically, moments of peace, internationally, a little bit of peace here and there's a um, little, you know, uh, intermissions as it were basically we've been at war since and it's not just war it's all the other conflict misunderstanding division and so and he's had so much to speak 
to me yeah. uh, as as uh, as I've moved through my life. But more more to the point, I think, is that um, is that it led to teaching him over and over and over across. That's you know, what 52 I, years. I wonder uh, partly how much you measure yourself against the books and how the books have changed for you over the years, but also what the what you've learned from the students, how the students have changed. Before we get to all that, though, I, I do want to ask, referring to the, the book itself, the mm -hmm. title of the book, The Human Crisis, that Camus refers to in, in 1946, how you characterize that and how you see it carrying over the, the 75 years since the address that he, he gave, or the lecture that he gave, where he refers to it. And then we'll get to your life and how it's been warped and, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and changed by Camus. <laughs> well, I have to, I have to admit that I, I discovered that speech mm -hmm. where the title of the book, of my book, comes from, because it was the title of his speech in New York in his only visit um, to um, to the United States, a brief visit in which he spoke at Columbia University. He visited a number of other a number of other campuses as well, uh, but that was that was the address that sort of marked that visit. I mean, that was what he was he was brought over by the French Cultural Commission, I think, and I think uh, Levi Strauss was actually the the president or the commissioner at yeah. that point and he actually bailed Kimu out when was it, when Kimu was detained by the FBI upon his entry into the port of New York yeah. but anyway um, that um, I only discovered that speech you know maybe five or six years ago and and it it floored me um, and I thought you know this is this is very, very early Camus. Um, what, how old was he then? In his early twenties or so, um, he was nineteen thirteen to nineteen forty six. Thirty three. Yeah. Thirty three. Yeah. Okay. So before the the big books. Oh yeah. Well, coming. he no, he had he had written the first in the before any of the first books came out in this country. Yeah. This, um, but uh, the stranger was already published in France and was already partially thanks to a very strong review by Sartre, um, very positive review. And so he was already becoming a, a fairly bright light in France. But well, a chronically misunderstood one, as you as you Yes, a chronically <laughs> misunderstood one. But he was very famous for his work in the resistance and yeah. in politics and so on. But as a literary figure, as a, as a literary figure on the same level, for instance, with Sartre, uh, or Moriac or, or Malraux, you know, that his that was just beginning to emerge. But he was invited um, um, to give this talk and it didn't, the talk didn't go over that well because uh, he was speaking to the wrong audience. He was speaking rather to the right audience at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but I discovered, when I discovered that, I thought, my God, this is, this is not only an introduction to Camus, his life and his works, but it's a kind of it's a kind of distillation of everything that he has written since that he wrote since that point. It's um, because it all comes down. I mean, the the the, the core message of that um, of that speech speak to us speaks to us today. I think more fiercely and more urgently than it did then. Um, the United States had just, of course, just um, as we saw it, um, won the war, defeated Hitler, defeated Japan. Um, of course, we had help as the Russians had a great deal to do with with Hitler's downfall as well. But but we sort of took credit. We saw ourselves as the saviors of the world at that point of the free world, and when we were we were reveling in that in that and. Um, and he came to, he came to say, well, they have two expectations. Partly that, in a way, that he was, he was going to take part as one of the liberated, as one of, um, of Europe. That we saw ourselves, the United States, 
as having liberated Paris and liberated France. And so um, we probably expected some celebration of that um, and some perhaps expression of gratitude for that. Um, but also, um, the, the, um, since the, he was regarded at that point, certainly in France, as, as, as the boldest, most promising young author in all of France and probably, possibly all of Europe. And so they wanted him to come over and say, because the, the, the arts uh, and literature and philosophy were thriving in France. We were beginning to focus on that, on the theater of the absurd, and so we, there was. Um, so basically, I think he was he was seen as being the, an emissary, or um, he was identified with that with that new, exciting um, emergence of of um, new emergence in the arts and in literature, and that he would give us a first-hand account of that. He didn't do that at all. You know, he, he, uh, uh, he, they expected, you know, a, um, an existentialist for one thing, and he turned out to be a moralist because he was never an existentialist. And everywhere he went in New York, students and others would, would ask him, you know, are you an existentialist? And he would say, he would just shake his head and say, no. Uh, but it didn't make any difference. Anyway, he was um, he gave this this lecture that the core of which was that that we're we're in crisis. We haven't just emerged from crisis. And he said, you know, the serpent um, Hitler has been defeated. The serpent has been beheaded. But we've all been infected. We all carry the poison in us, and and uh, and you carry the poison in you. The Americans, yeah, you brought it back, uh, and uh, and if you need any proof of that, look at Hiroshima, and the because the United States was was celebrating how they defeated Japan, and that there was you know spontaneous celebration in the streets um, with the explosions of the nuclear of the nuclear bomb, and he said you know that that was the the greatest expression of of of, uh, of consummate um, savagery that that he could imagine, and and so the, he he came as a moralist, as a you know as a Jeremiah, um, not as a party goer, and and that was that was kind of a shock. They weren't ready for that. The audience wasn't ready for that, and and of course he, the entire speech was given in French, which narrowed, I think, the audience, well, naturally, it narrowed the audience to those who, who could understand spoken French, um, and those who could have probably learned French through reading literature and, and philosophy, yeah. and so they weren't necessarily involved in politics, and perhaps not all that many of them had been in the war. Um, so anyway, that was the, the um, and it was very interesting the way he began that speech. Very early in the speech, he simply tells four stories, all of which are drawn from from real stories that he knew. I mean, these were vignettes of of what he had as a member of the resistance um, come to know. And the um, I could I could read. Oh yes, please feel free. I was going to say they're that. better to uh, excerpt rather than saying that's a bunch of Sophie's um, Choice type stuff. But yeah, yeah, you can give yeah. Well, one of them is actually a story story similar to that. Yeah. But um, he says, you know, in, in an apartment building occupied by the Gestapo in a European capital, most likely France. That's not said. But yeah. two accused men, still bleeding, find themselves tied up after a night of interrogation. The concierge of the building begins her careful household chores in good spirits since she probably just finished breakfast. Reproached by one of the tortured men, she replies indignantly, I never interfere with my landlord's business, um, or my tenant's business, rather. Um, and then in Lyon, where, where Kimu was very much involved, Lyon was a center of the combat network. And it's actually, I believe, where the 
newspaper, the underground newspaper of which he was the editor-in-chief, was printed and from which it was you know, therefore distributed. In Lyon, one of my comrades is dragged from... I have to get closer to it. To sure. <laughs> In Lyon, one of my comrades is dragged from his cell for a third round of questioning. And there, you know, of torturing, for questioning. sure. Yeah. Yes. Since his ears have been badly torn during the previous session, he is wearing a bandage around his head. The German officer who interrogates him is the same man who conducted the previous sessions. And yet he asks him, with an air of affectionate concern, how are your ears doing? Um, he tells, those are two of the four stories he tells. Uh, why does he begin with the stories? Well, first of all, storytelling is his superpower, uh, but also because I believe it's because anyone who can hear these four stories and not know what the human crisis is that he's talking about, they could just as well leave then. Mm -hmm. you know, that this is... This is um, that, in other words, if, if we have become so insensitive that we are not driven to moral outrage and shock at the stories, if they don't shock us, then he's made his point that the poison is in us. But he says, he sums it all up in, this, in, in these words, I've chosen these stories because they allow me to respond with something other than a conventional yes to the question, is there a human crisis? They allow me to reply, just as the men I was speaking about replied, yes, there is a human crisis, because in today's world, we can contemplate the death or even the torture of a human being with a feeling of indifference, friendly concern, scientific interest, or simple passivity. Now, that crisis distilled in those words is certainly all around us today. Um, and, um, um, and if we all have our own stories from our, from our lives and from the newspapers and from our experiences, the stories we hear from others, if, if, if we don't see the connection, how that, that crisis describes our our life and our world today, then we, um, I mean, one example would simply be something you and I were talking about mm -hmm. before this, um, Gil, that if we're not concerned, if, if, he have, if we have indifference um, or a lack of concern over the world we are handing on, down to our children and our grandchildren, knowing the suffering that that will entail, knowing that uh, the, what we have done to the country and the world that we have enjoyed and profited from, it, and it, um, if that we're able to contemplate the future um, in that way, without, with indifference um, and greed, um, then, then um, we need to ask ourselves whether there's, whether we really believe or can see that we, are, you know, that there is a human crisis. I mean, for me, it's something I didn't mention earlier, but my drive up, I pass the signs for Newtown and Sandy Hook, and you think of of the massacre there in well, almost ten years ago, and the. Now is not the time to politicize, and you know it's it's thoughts and prayers, and you know this was something that could never have been uh, you know predicted, and they're actually crisis actors, and, and just every way of distancing ourselves from any culpability for a room full of six year old children being murdered, yeah. and yeah, there there are you know aspects of this that you know when I I read that first chapter where you 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 know. Uh, illustrate uh, Camus' visit and, and the lecture itself. It was, yeah, yeah, I can see where he's coming from. It's it's not as explicit necessarily as, you know, what we went through with, with World War II and what it was like to live in, I would say live under evil, but live within evil. 
but it's it's part of our our day to day. And yeah. of course, we know now that Sandy Hook was not an isolated event. And um, my wife has taught; well, she just retired, but she taught many years as a as a first grade teacher in the public schools. And the layout of her school and uh, the Sandy Hook school was um, was a kind of sister school. There were a lot of connections between my wife's school and Sandy Hook school. And the layout of the two schools was such that the first grade classes um, are situated in the same place in the build in the two buildings. And so um, the you know the the shooter. At, at in at Sandy Hook came in and sort of turned right and went into the first grade class, um, and um, it didn't take any stretch of imagination for my wife to see how that to picture that in her in her school. And ever since, they have lockdowns and they have you know they have active shooter drills. And so, and those are those are um, the drills themselves. As I know, with work working with with veterans and active duty service people, traumatized by their experiences, um, military training can be every bit. I shouldn't say every bit. It can it can approximate the trauma that actual you know um, combat situations. Um, um, yeah, I, in in you know in yeah. uh, inflict and. Uh, and this is something that our children are growing up with. Um, See, me as a kid, we had the the Russians are going to nuke us. Yes. Horrible. But, you know, all we had was duck behind these lockers or duck under your, your desk. There was no, you know, these are the procedures for when yes, yes. a shooter comes in. I, I read these things now. And, and as we were talking about before we started, I'm incredibly thankful not to have children. As terrible as that sounds for, you know, mm -hmm. mankind and its lineage. Um but yeah, I just couldn't couldn't conceive of what it would be to have kids who are prepped to assume this is going to happen at some point in your life to the point at which we have to prepare you yeah, for this. Yeah. You know, nuclear blast. Yeah, you know, we all knew from from video games and everything else that you know the locker was not really going to help. But but yeah, I, I there are many aspects of how our our at least national psyche, if not global psyche, is is just progressively getting warped and yeah. and deranged, which gets far afield of Kevin. Well, maybe it, it doesn't does, get far afield it, of Kevin, actually. It, but, yeah. uh, not that he ever could have foreseen that. He could never, as a journalist, foreseen that facts would become so completely irrelevant in, in our national conversations. Well, um, I mean, take Orwell. I mean, he, he recognized that you know power is going to dictate what facts are. And, and and that your acceptance of that is is your subjugation to to power. Well, that's yeah. But the, that's a different thing. Yeah. That, yeah. The, there's no such thing. They, they lived in a in a factual world. Pe people on different sides claimed those facts. Yeah. They, they never asserted there's no such thing, which is basically where we are at the moment, in a, in a sort of post factual, and a post human world. Yeah. In, in, increasingly, we. Um, I I read that in. Um, in in a survey, uh, I think it was in the United States that um, uh, that you know, would people would people prefer that we make crucial life and death decisions? That crucial life and death decisions are made by artificial intelligence working with the best algorithms that can be invented, or do we want people making those decisions? And Nearly half of the people um, who were surveyed, you know, indicated that they would be perfectly happy with, with, um, you know, with algorithms and um, and, and robots. I imagine they're autonomous they're... robots, and yeah. probably because they think it's cool. I mean, there's there's some. There's, I think there's, there's also a. Level. It couldn't be any worse than people making those decisions. <laughs> I think that that might play into. It I think that <laughs> the distrust that that yeah. indicates in 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 rational thinking and. Common sense and common decency, yeah. which um, I mean, certainly Camus knew those were being violated at the time mm -hmm. in his life, and he saw common decency being, but but there was such a thing, and 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 he said he said 
he, he later restated what I read a moment ago about um, you know the, the point he was trying to make that we've reached the point where we can we can uh, contemplate or even engage in torture and 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 killing without it affecting us. He he um, he later made the point that um, that what what stunned him what he um, what he didn't think was possible was that people could torture another human being and continue to look at that at, at that victim in the face. Yeah. That 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 in other words there, there were there had to be some innate sense of shame and of sense of violation uh, that even the torturer would, um, you know, would, 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 would look away. I mean, yeah. involuntarily, perhaps, look away. Uh, and he said, you know, and he knew very well in the resistance from any number of comrades that had been tortured and survived, so any number who had been tortured and did not survive, but he knew from those who survived those stories. And um, um, unfortunately, sadly, shockingly, um, you know, we have played our part in the United States in that. I, um, I have a number of Chilean friends, I was just going very, to very to, close yeah. friends um, whom I'm still in touch with, and um, <clears throat> and one of them was uh, I, I won't I won't give their names or their but I I was um, I was in a in a religious order for a number of years Catholic religious order as a um, and we were in um, had taken our vows together and we all left eventually. But we were we members of a of a Catholic religious um, community, and they were from Chile. These 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 fellows, and they went back and were involved in various ways in in the coup and its aftermath. And one of them was, in fact, he's the only one who remained a priest, um, and he who went on was ordained and has remained a priest. But he was commissioned by the the papal nuncio or whatever in Chile under Pinochet um, to go into the prisons and and investigate what's going on there and he talked with a number of, um, of prisoners who had been tortured including his brother who had been imprisoned and tortured who was also a priest um, and what what they couldn't quite um, could, couldn't quite wrap their minds around that. That's a slang. I hate to use slang when talking about something that serious, but the was the fact that <clears throat> for the for the torturers, um, they for the torturers, it was a business. It was a job, yeah. and if um, and they had they had developed the art or or acquired the skill. Of torturing without um, without involvement, and he said, "This is what this is why I was told by them that people knew the people even being tortured knew that eventually they would give up the information that they they wanted mm -hmm. because they knew just how far to go without killing someone first of all, um, and they also knew um, they they." They couldn't get involved because, first of all, if they did, if there was animosity between the two, they would embolden the person being tortured. If it became a struggle of wills, yeah. or if they actively, visibly, manifestly hated one another, and that anger came into effect, it would make the victims stronger and more resistant, and also it would it would make them probably. Um, sloppy, kill, sloppy yeah. and therefore kill the person. Mm -hmm. So what they had developed was this this professional calm. Um, they might as well have been air traffic controllers. Or so they came in and they would attach the electrodes or whatever devices they were using, all of whom had been provided and on which they had been trained by the United States. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and what they would do is, uh, he said, if they were if they were 
inches away from getting the information they wanted, and the and the lunch bell rang or whatever, yeah. then they they would set their clock and they'd take their lunch break. If it was time for their lunch break or the coffee break, even though they were inches away, they would stop yeah. and leave. It wouldn't, uh, uh, and and no one involved in engaged, invested in that process of torturing someone who, who wanted that information. Um, no one would do that, but they were these were professionals, and they had learned the profession uh, and a professional approach to torture from us. Um, that's what I was told, and that's um, and then, you know. And the, so we have a lot to naturally to um, to answer to, but also we have a lot that speaks directly to what Camus was saying. This people who are able to look at, you know, in, uh, at the their grandchildren yeah. in the eye and say it's all going to be all right and, and then go and, and, and rape the country in various ways or, or um, you know, um, and, you know the, the, I don't want to go into details of no. what I think is, is in fact um, uh, morally reprehensible behavior with yeah. respect to the environment and so on. Yeah, I did drive two and a half hours up here, so I kind of yeah. added to my yeah. carbon footprint in the yes. process. But we, <laughs> well, we are, but, uh, but, well, the but I know, I, I know from talking with you yeah. before we hit over the interview how concerned you are about that, and I, 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 I trust that you're not, we all have to live when we, when we try to do our, yeah. our work as best we can, but there are, there are flagrant um, I mean, things we can do um, and not do in order to be able to look our children in the eye and our grandchildren in the eye. But there's a degree that I, I wonder about those, and we're getting far off of Camus at this point, but the sense well, not of... Not really. I think we're getting deeper. I know. Into it, but, <laughs> I realize. As I, I know in my take classes, right when, I talk, yeah. when, when I bring up these points, um, which come out of Camus, the students... Um, be, be, they can begin start correlating to their lives. Uh, correlate that with their lives. They begin talking with their lives, and then we go back to Camus, and it's a different, a far richer. Uh, now I'm thinking about it in relation yeah. to the fall, especially. But yes, but exactly. Yeah, the the sense at which um, you know having an electric car is like buying indulgences. You know the oh I, I can afford to I'm not committing the the environmental sins I I you know and I can show my neighbors and everybody else that I'm environmentally conscious. Uh, even though on a grander scale, yeah, you know everything is still you're, you're still contributing to the disaster in, in you know so many ways, and that all the little things that we do, all the recycling and everything else, doesn't add up to what the the major companies are contributing. Right, right. They manage to shift the blame onto us and make us think about our carbon footprints as opposed to you know much worse yeah, environmental yeah, impact yeah, of, yeah. of you know general business as well as all the you know rare earth materials and everything else that goes into our phones and, and computers and all the environmental disaster that goes into that stuff. You know, that sense of, I guess, individual responsibility versus collective, I guess, which is, again, in keeping with yeah, what you yeah. wrote about for, for the course of this book, what, what it means to have a collective humanity. Talk about that. <laughs> Talk about well, Camus, especially. I mean, we're, we're, <laughs> to leap back into, into Camus, um, or to crawl back, um, the um, or because we're not that far away from him. The character of Taru in the in 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 the plague. I mean, he he says, you know, that none of us are innocent. Yeah. We are all. Uh, um, he said, you can't breathe in this world w without participating in killing and in the diminishment of others of others' lives. The ultimate diminishment of the li of life, of course, is the extinction of it. But we all are are he's in in um, we all are guilty, and and that the uh, but he said the most and there's no 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 way to become a saint. He wanted to become a saint without God, a godless saint, yeah. which means he wanted to be perfect. He wanted to to have clean hands, as it were. And he says, you know, there's really no such thing as clean hands, but some hands are cleaner than others. I mean, that's, we, and he said, you know, what we have to, um, uh, what we strive for is, is a mild, benevolent, 
diabolism. Um, and, <laughs> yeah. and that, that is, that says it in, in a way, you know, that where we can't, we all, if we think of Dante's hell, you know, we've, we've, all of the various levels of infractions against humanity and against God, the, uh, you know, we're all, we're all guilty. We all, we're on one level or another. Um, and, um, but, you know, we can, we can temper it, we can reduce it, we can strive to, um, uh, it's, it, you know, it, Camus, in his own life, was, uh, as, as I do explain in the book, you know, he wasn't, he was an uneasy pacifist. Um, I mean, he, he began as a pacifist, but then um, at the beginning of the war, he, he tried to enlist. Uh, now, pacifists don't enlist in, in, in the army. Uh, it's to carry a, to, to wear a uniform at that point was definitely to carry a gun because yeah. Hitler was making his way over through Poland and so and he was you know he was on his way to France and at some point and so they were marshalling forces to stop him and so he he in, tried to enlist but with uh, with one lung collapsed most of the time or a lot of the time the other intermittently collapsing at the same time he 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 was refused um, entry into the military as he was in refused entry into teaching to get a Camus pacifism it, it's interesting uh, again as you in the book you know carry him chronologically yes both through his life and through the, the the books themselves and his progression it's you know the pacifism comes off as a reaction to both the war and the purge afterwards that it's you know that it, that's there were I hate to, to use the term necessary killings uh, when, when you were part of the underground as well as, you know, during the purge afterwards. But that once he sees it get out of hand, which we all know, these things always get out of hand. We know that historically, but when you're mm -hmm. in the moment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's why they get out of hand, because we're in the moment. Um, but it really seems, you know, afterwards that he becomes that much more avid or committed, I suppose, to that, that cause. Is it mischaracterizing it? No, and actually... Yeah. The term necessary killing is, is one that is, um, that I, and many others, but I have, uh, in my work with, with battle trauma and moral injury in war and in insurrection, or um, because I've worked in North, uh, Northern Ireland with paramilitaries and uh, troubles in Northern Ireland, those <clears throat> um, Necessary killing is is actually a category now in the discussion of the morality of of war and of killing and of of moral injury as a result and um, and on the side um, this is this is going to be a slight diversion. Oh, I've got a much know. greater diversion about George Orwell's Inside the Whale well, that yeah, I'm going to jump to after this. But come on. <laughs> well, the, I, I've been deeply because I've 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 written a book on 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 um, attacking the just Western just war theory, mm -hmm. and um, and Camus would have been if he had addressed it, been a fierce critic of the just war theory as well. Because for him there was no just war and there was no just killing. Yeah. Uh, all killing was murder. Um, he 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 refused to use the terminology. To that, to... That it, yeah, that I mean, um, when you take a life, it's, it's unintentionally take a life, knowingly take a life. That regardless of whether it's in self defense or, um, and it's interesting that in Western just war theory. Uh, early on in his foundings in, in Christian theology in Augustine and Aquinas, um, um, at least for Augustine, modified later, not by him, but by his successors, um, the one kind of killing that was not sinful, I mean, that was always sinful, rather, which could never be justified, um, was killing in self-defense, um, hmm. which is an interesting, that's, yeah, the exact That's another book, of... another time, another issue. Yeah. But but the in the in the Orthodox Orthodox Christianity, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, they have never accepted. Um, they basically embraced Camus, but it wasn't 
not by his <laughs> name, um, and and that is that that the one kind of killing that is necessary and is still sinful, but you just have to do it basically um, is is to protect the innocent, mm. not yourself, but to protect the innocent, and 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 um, and that was. Um, you know, people like Bonhoeffer, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in, in World War II, who was eventually um, killed, sent to a death camp and was died in, in a firing range. No, he was, yeah, I think he was executed by firing range. Um, you know, he was a, he was a, a, a priest, was a, a, um, a Lutheran, Lutheran priest who was who wrote a great deal, wrote many, many, many books, and is one of the most revered pacifists. And he had, he um, participated in the plot to assassinate Hitler. And uh, and it was it's very interesting that what he what he said what he repented of. I mean, he knew he was committing a sin, um, okay. and um, uh, as Camus would say, he was in fact. And he 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 um, he embraced that uh, his sinfulness, as it were. By that I mean that he he it was something he had to do, but the price he had to pay, uh, he had to become sinful in order to protect to stop to stop Hitler, and and so he he asked for forgiveness, um, not because they had failed. But because he had actually participated in it, and he, and he said he would just hope he would be forgiven for that, uh, but that that didn't allow him to didn't cloud him with doubt about the, the necessity of making that decision. Yeah. The difference that, between being just and being necessary in that case, it wasn't well. Just means that, again uh, justified. Just, yeah. You know, uh, and and originally, just war theories in the West became they were. There was a legal side and a moral side. No, we've left the moral side behind, and it's legal. Uh, it, it, it's it's legal killing. Well, I mean, and the same thing with, with yeah. enhanced interrogation. Yeah, yeah. In, in America, became you know a legal technicality. For, it's know. whether you break the break the law or not. And of course, the law, the bar. We we possess and control the bar where the, the line yeah. between legal and illegal is. As, as 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 Plato said, you know, the laws are simply the the um, the the, what, uh, the um, I'm trying to remember the exact phrase that that um, well we know if it was Plato and it was, related it was, to the the yeah. laws that would end up sending Socrates to his death that's that's you know chances well, it's are simply the the promulgation of the self interest of the powerful yeah uh, that's basically that it's it's the hmm. the passing of a law is, is simply the passing of the self interest. The self-interest of the powerful by the powerful. Anyway, um, we can't go by what's just in a legal sense and expect to find in that line um, a line, an accurate line between what's moral and immoral. Uh, but we, we uh, Camus, back to Camus, that that when uh, the purge was, and then so he he embraced the the resistance. He himself did not, you know, participate in the in active combat on behalf of the resistance. He was he worked from a desk, um, and also worked, you know, gathering information and intelligence and so on. But he didn't carry a gun. He carried several passports with different identities in case he was ever caught. Because the um, and he said, you know, there are people who fight. I mean, there are people who kill and people who heal. And he said, I try to be one of the healers, but we, we both groups fight. And he was fighting with words. But he said that, that uh, as Machiavelli said, the, the, uh, there are armed prophets and unarmed prophets, and the armed prophets always win. But he said, uh, and Camus' amendment on that was, the armed the un, the armed prophets never win without um, uh, if the, if how did he put that the 
the uh, the armed prophet always beat the unarmed prophet, but when unarmed prophets also have the right on their side, they will. I mean, when they take up arms, it will, they will always defeat. So words, words, and arms will always defeat pure arms. Right. And then, so he he was the other wing um, of the of the resistance, yeah. and but he uh, he didn't remotely condemn those who were assassinated engaging in assassinations and raids and sabotage and, and all of that but he, he um, so but after the war as you as you mentioned uh, referring to the purge he felt that for a very brief period of time justice had to be done but he saw that as a debt to those who had been tortured um, and killed and he said we can't he said, he said, I can't forgive on their behalf. And so he, he said that he, he, the decision whether to or not to execute those who had, were responsible for the tortures and deaths of others, it would be up to the survivors in a yeah. way. And, and, yeah. and, but he, he re, very, after six months or so, he went back on that and said, that um, uh, and agreed with his opponent, Francois Mariette. They had conducted a, a very public debate in the press back and forth. Francois Mariette was a member of the resistance himself. I think he, he joined the resistance slightly before Camus. Um, he was, uh, I believe he was also for a brief period of time in the military, in the French military, before they were defeated by the Germans. He, uh, as I said, won the Nobel Prize for literature, um, he, he, he was so admirable in Camus' terms in, in many ways. He, he deplored and condemned the torture of, of, of um, in, in Algeria, the torture of Algerians by the military. He condemned the war in Vietnam, and he was, he, he was very much um, shoulder to shoulder with Malraux, I mean with Camus. Uh, but he, he could not uh, embrace ex public execution, and I, not public execution, but you know, um, yeah, the, the purge, the purge, that point I mean, of, of, uh, yeah, yeah. judicial execution, and he was a devout Catholic, and this was simply, simply something he, these were not necessary deaths, uh, these were not protecting the innocent any longer, because once they were in in, in, in the hands of the authorities, they can no longer do any harm. So, um, so that justification was was simply um, uh, was simply not there, and they had to. Uh, so he he said, "What the world, what we in France and the world needs now is not justice of that sort, not um, not lethal justice, but mercy." And Camus sort of ridiculed him for that. And they had a number of arguments. German Bray told me once they had an argument. Um, uh, they met somehow in a hallway somewhere. And, and, and um, I, I suppose it was probably during the time that, that they were at odds with one another in the press over this. And, um, and the... Um, and I guess I can't reconstruct the conversation, but it's something to the effect that Mariak said, you know, that I know about suffering, and Catholics know about suffering, uh, and Jesus suffered, was tortured for three hours on the cross, uh, and he forgave. And Camus apparently, in kind of an unforgivable, snarky comment, said as Malraux was getting into the elevator, yeah. For three hours, um, yeah. and and so this was this it reached a kind of unfortunate level between them when they were having this, this discussion, and Camus, uh, since they had had a public, um, <clears throat> such a public uh, quarrel with one another, um, he made his recantation publicly and said. Moriac was right. We need mercy. Yeah. Um, 
mercy is right. And, and so that was, so he, that was one of the most remarkable things about Camus. He, he, he was not embarrassed when he changed his mind. And when he did change his mind, even the over very public and strong statements he had made, um, he, he did so publicly. Uh, and because if he had stated a position he now rejected, he wanted others to reject it too. Yeah. Because he felt he was wrong. And he, so he didn't sort of whisper that to Mariak. Um, he, he, he shouted it in the newspapers that, you know, the purge has failed. This was this was wrong, and and I and Mariak was right. Within the book, you you cite Camus' um, literary structure, the 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 series of works he was going to do with different phases that were going to to convey you know his his approach to to let's say life, the universe, and everything. Mm -hmm. um, as a thinker, I guess, how much did that evolve versus? How much was you know? Uh, how much did he you know? Did you almost feel that he grew into or diverged from what those those earlier models would have been for him? I, I know it's a weird way of phrasing it, but when one puts together an overarching model in one's youth about where you're going to go, and then experiences even without World War II and the resistance, life as we know it, um, those things tend to go off the rails. You know, how much do you think? His, uh, we'll say, fictional slash philosophical project involved his own need to change, mature, and, and learn. You get what I mean? Oh, I do. Okay. I do. <laughs> I, I think that, that that there are certain issues on which he evolved in ways he didn't he didn't anticipate. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, but I think he knew from the very earliest endeavors in, in, in his own writing, he knew where he was going with his fiction and his philosophy. Uh, we know this because of the notebooks, yeah. the three volumes of notebooks that have been, that have been published. Yeah, that's, that's what I sort of um, wonder, how much was preformed and how much, in a sense, how much is a surprise to him? As he's, as he's well, maybe what he made of these things might have been, I mean, certainly his, um, they began as an outline. Yeah. I mean, if you, in, if you're writing anything, um, I mean, you, you told me you had notes about this, um, uh, <laughs> yeah. beforehand <laughs> about where you possibly would anticipate, you know, our conversation going and, uh. And even when you write something, you know, when you write, a, um, when you begin outlining a, uh, you know, an, an essay or a lecture or whatever, you you begin with some kind of outline. But it, it as it, that, that outline becomes a book, um, there's a whole lot more in that in in that than there was in in the outline. But to a surprising degree, he had the skeletal. Um, vision of his literary project clear from the beginning. Um, it was clear that he, on the one hand, he was going to uh, to follow three sort of archetypes, archetypal mythical figures of Sisyphus, Prometheus, and Nemesis. Those three, those three uh, avatars which would, whose stories would somehow be a distillation of, of what he would unfold at great length um, were there from the very beginning. We know from his notebooks. I don't think anyone can, can really get uh, very far into understanding Camus' work and the progression of it without reading the notebooks. And I think they're, they're, they're greatly overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many people actually, actually read the notebooks. Um, most Camus readers, you know, if I, if my students over, you know, fifty years, are are an indication before they took my Camus class, I always ask them what Camus have they read, and and um, of course most who have read who had read anything read The Stranger, and 
a handful had read the play. Now, that would be different now because it's become a bestseller again. Yeah, that but, said, uh, a but, pal of mine, a contemporary of mine yeah. I went to high school with, wrote me when I, I posted an Instagram picture of, of holding the book up uh, as my, my current reading uh-huh. a couple of days ago or a week or so ago. Uh, she wrote to say her 17-year-old daughter just read The Stranger and is now her favorite book. And I said, yeah... I have a feeling that's going to change. I hope that's going to change, or at least that what she likes about it is not, you know, is the growing pains we all go through with, with Camus, as you did. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, yeah, so, so The Stranger is still... The, yeah. the outlines, the outline of his project yeah. can be found in the, in the notebooks right. uh, very early. He never intended these to be published, um, and so they're... I'll just say the outlines of literary projects I came up with in my 20s are not something I would ever want to look (laughs) at. We'll put it that way from our our mutual time in Hampshire back in the the early 90s. And they also had to be deciphered, just the writing, because they were handwritten, and and, and he had his own kind of private shorthand. Hmm. He also um, had the habit, when thinking eventually that these might become public. I mean, his writings might become public. He very often, in the early drafts of things, he he referred to characters who were based on real life. He referred to those characters um, by um, an initial or a pseudonym, or so he wouldn't forget who he was talking about. It. Yeah. No one could say, accuse him, however, of saying this person this based is, on this person is yeah. his wife, or this person is. Yeah. Is uh, is this particular friend of his or whatever? Um, <clears throat> so, he, but but more to the point, the the uh, the outline was there that there would be three, and then he eventually developed that into four stages. But it's, it's very early on. I mean, when he's writing the stranger, before he's writing the stranger, I mean that's uh, he he. Uh, so there were the, the these mythical archetypes that w- would oversee the progression um, and also the fact that in each of these phases of his writing he would write plays, philosophy and literature Um, and so that each of them would have at least one piece of fiction one a philosophical essay and a um, uh, and, and a drama and so, in and he followed that through till he got to the Nemesis. By that time, um, a whole lot had happened in his life. He had changed his his you know his his world had changed. He that 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 sort of um, it, it just many things were unraveling, yeah. but also developing in in. in uh, and he wanted to move on to the fourth stage of love, rather than, and, and um, I mean, we could get into that, but it breaks down. Perhaps he didn't foresee it breaking down, but there was a, the myth of Sisyphus, then there was going to be the myth of Prometheus, which eventually got the name the rebel, um, the, um, the philosophical essay, and then there was going to be the myth of Nemesis. He never wrote the myth of Nemesis at all, the, the myth of Prometheus became a work that was uh, probably inconceivable to him when he originally thought. Oh, yeah, it, yeah. Uh, it didn't, doesn't look at all like the myth of, of, of Sisyphus, yeah. for one thing. It's hundreds of pages long, and it's a, it's a whole different genre of philosophical and historical discussion. And, uh, but... The fact that they would all that, that he would pursue the theme of each, the concerns of each, from um, um, in in these three genres, that was planned from the very beginning, and 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 also that that there would be a truth that would be lie at the center. Of uh, an ethic, as it were, yeah, and I think that's that would lie I mean. at the center of each of these. Well, I wonder. And about. and the myth of Sisyphus is is his existentialist phase. Not that he was an existentialist at the time that he wrote it, but this would be the um, uh, the, the, the exploration yeah. of that particular way of thinking and way of living, a way of thinking and a way of living that he with which he partly agreed. 
um, and and on the other hand, completely renounced. Um, I, I could go into, but the, uh, um, but you know, in 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 Aristotle's Ethics, because Camus said his whole project in some way was to replace politics with ethics. Um, his whole vision is an ethical vision. Um, and, and when we look, for instance, at Aristotle's two works of ethics, the Eudemian ethics and the Nicomachean ethics, they all have these three, three kinds of life, these three ethos, eth, ethe, or whatever the ethos means, just a, 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 you know, a way of living, a way we speak about having an ethic. It doesn't mean we, it, it, that's not synonymous with something being ethical as we understand that word. You can have an ethos that is not ethical. It's just the, the whole shape of your life and what you, what you care about, what you strive for, what you enjoy, and so on. And, and so there was the, the sensual, the, the political, and the intellectual. Um, and um, Aristotle had also three, three um, moral or ethical um, visions or th that correspond to ways of life. Um, Kierkegaard did the same thing in his, mm -hmm. in, in, he has the same, a life of enjoyment, a life of, 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 of moral pleasure, I mean, of, rather, of sensual pleasure, a life of ethical action, and a life of intellectual pursuit. And, and so, um, in, when you're in the first stage, when you're in the first, you know, the, the life of, of sensual enjoyment, sensual pleasure, uh, pleasure and pain um, are measured by bodily pleasure and pain. Um, you find the same thing in Augustine. Yeah. Um, that the... Um, and, and Merceau is a sensualist. Uh, in the beginning, he he uh, he has he's very much within within himself, and and his life is guided by by his sensory experiences, um, and I don't know how whether to go on and try to discuss how what it is about the existentialism that um, I don't. I don't oh, want to go into be a an spoiler explication, the book, but, explication but, yeah. of the of 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 how he sort of. Um, well, I mean, you talk within the book. I mean, you talk about how he comes to understand time and and memory and start to exceed the the, the sensual, um, which of course makes me feel like a heel for not having read Augustine since I was at St. John's twenty five years ago and realizing I need to to mm -hmm. you know read all that again. Okay, read it. You know, in depth for the first time to to you know mm -hmm. better understand everything about who we are nowadays and and you know how thought developed. Um, but it raised the question. I mean, within the book, you you devote a significant space to the the stranger, but also the plague. Uh, you, you cover these things chronologically, of course. Um, the plague seems to be the one for which I don't want to say you she seem to show the most affection. That I do. Yeah. But it does seem to be, maybe it's simply because it's coming on the heels of The Stranger and the, the progression of, of your book, but it seems to be, at least within the imminent world, a fulfillment, uh, you know, a, a transcending of what Mirceau is into what it means to, to live among other human beings. Again, the political self as opposed mm -hmm. to the, the purely intellectual one. Um, which raises the question of if you have to, to you know, tell someone one Camus book to read besides the notebooks, what do you what do you recommend to them? Um, it partly depends on where they are and what they want to see addressed. Yeah. Um, another form of that question is what is my favorite Camus? Yeah, book? I know. I didn't want to put it that uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite Camus? I think The Fall. Yeah. Uh, but. If you begin with the fall, you'll be completely. You won't. You, I, I, I think it would be extremely difficult to read the fall and understand it without 
going through the progression yeah. that, that, that Camus goes through and going from the stranger of the play to the fall. I mean, mm -hmm. this is, they're all meant to be read together, and that's, that's admittedly pretentious on Camus' part to think that, 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 that his readers will, will walk the same walk that, that he does, and, mm -hmm. and, and will read, read through his work the the fullness of his work and read them in the order in which he wrote them, which is even more uh, sort of inconceivable. And so, um, unless you're going to spend your life with Camus, which I am very glad I have uh, spent mine, um, I think it's I think it's I mean, this is this is impossibly self-promotional of me to say, but I think it might be good to read a book that gives you the whole picture before you read you know, a secondary work if you're not going to commit yourself to reading all three, um, The Stranger, The Plague, and The Fall. Um, but that's not that big a task. I mean, The Fall is shorter than The Stranger. Yeah. I mean, these are very short, as you know. I mean, you can read them I've never read the fall until this past week, uh, and, and, and it was you know three it, days, uh, three uh, two nights before going to bed, and yeah. then you know it's been a little time the next morning, yeah. and just yeah. all of a sudden I'm like, okay, yeah. this is this is you know I, I wanted to read it before I got to your chapters on it because I was afraid you were going to give away the plot. I'm just kidding, that, that's yeah, not yeah, really yeah, a plot yeah. plot, but you know that's that's it was have it under my belt before you start right. citing it. Kierkegaard, who had a lot of influence on on Camus, mm -hmm. I mean he named. Kimu named his dog after Kierkegaard. <laughs> I was wondering about Kirk, yeah. Yeah. And um, in his formative youth, Kimu was very influenced by, by Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard had the good sense, as it were, or the self-realization to, because he, he had the, the, when his works unfold across the same three, um, his works, because he's convinced human life, human being unfolds across his, in these stages of, of you know the the sensual life, the ethical life, and the and the religious life, because he saw the pursuit of truth eventually leading to God, yeah. and as as did Aristotle, and um, and so leading to the divine, and so, but what he did was write his he invented a whole lot of pseudonyms. So the um, he wrote a very sensual book celebrating Don Juan and 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 so yeah. that is probably one of the influences on Camus in writing about the absurd hero of the you know the the Don Juan figure the lover the seducer and um, you know and the conqueror and the actor and so um, in 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 the myth of Sisyphus the anyway the um, he wrote his, as it were, existentialist books or sensual books or amoral books under a pseudonym. So he, those books had 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 fans and readers, avid readers, uh, who were um, um, who didn't know who was writing them. They didn't know that he also yeah. had religious books. He had some very, he had theological books, metaphysical books. Um, Kierkegaard did, and um, and downright devotional works, and I think part of the strategy of Kierkegaard was that he would have separate readers for these different ways of thinking and living, and when they suddenly realized that the that that they had been tricked, and that yeah. the 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 writer of these devotional works, whom the sensual readers. Um, you know, the pulp fiction, as it were, the Kierkegaard wrote very far from pulp fiction. But the pulp fiction readers, when they suddenly realized that, you know, that these were written by Thomas Merton, for instance, that Thomas Merton all, all, yeah. always, I mean, what, imagine the effect of Thomas Merton having written Bodice Were Rippers. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then it coming out that, that he wrote those. Um, they would be led, you know, they'd be led to read, read their way up the human scale. That's where they might be. Or the devotional guys might start. They might reading start. Smug. Yeah, that might go also. back to the beginning. <laughs> but um, so, you know, it's easier if you kind of. I mean, Kierkegaard realized 
he had this, these stages, sta he called them Stages on Life's Way. And he wrote a book called Stages on Life's Way, but he also wrote, wrote exclusively from within one stage or another stage or another stage, but under, under different names. And so maybe Camus would have been served by, by, by inventing a number of pseudonyms and writing under them. I'm not sure. But it's a problem. It's a real problem that, that Camus never in men, meant the stranger to be taken seriously. And when they did, readers did. He, he, he got, uh, in the notebooks, you read his response to, to uh, a letter that had been written to him, and he was, he was insulted. Camus was outraged that someone had really imagined that he was promoting uh, someone who'd written about his work as a new form of, of a new atheistic amorality or something like that. And, and uh, he was outraged. He said, do you really think I am holding up to be, um, to be admired and, and imitated a man who murders another human being in cold blood and, and does it it's completely unaffected by his mother's death. Camus was, you really think I'm that kind of person? And because Camus was extraordinarily devoted to his mother. She was Germaine Bray, it was, that was the one um, deepest love of his life with a, with a woman and with another person really, that that was, he was, he was terribly devoted to his, to his mother. Um, and um, and the idea of I mean, she outlived him, but if she hadn't, her death would have devastated him. And he when me, when she would when he would learn that she was ill, you know, he would fly right whatever else he was doing, he would fly off to Algiers and and be with her. Um, so the this idea that that that, that Merceau is some kind of of hero to be held up and imitated was just, you know, how could you get that so wrong? But, you know, 90% perhaps of his readers have. Uh, and that's a question when you're teaching it. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll launch into that, in fact. Yeah, yeah. A, what you've learned from, from teaching him. B, you know, what have you learned about students and how they've changed over 50 years of, of teaching Camus? And I did not take your class because I was a fucking moron back at Hampshire and didn't think <laughs> it was something I should do. I, I, I look back at myself uh, then and, and just want to, you know, hit myself upside the face and neck repeatedly and say, go take these classes. Um, but yes, I did not take your, your chemo class. So I'm coming at this completely open uh, to, to full disclosure. Experience. Yeah. But how, again, what did you learn through teaching him and what is it? taught you about students or how have you seen students change in their approach to them? Way back in the distant past you asked me a question at which I have diverted from maybe six or seven times. But it's it was, ring method. It it's it's did, the, uh, the model that, yes, that Homer used. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's a, another past podcast. Ring composition. Yeah, that's... <laughs> um, and that was, you know, when did it all begin? How did, when did this book begin? Yeah, that was actually the starting question. Uh, yeah, that was the in a, in a St. John sort of way. But go yeah, on. yeah, yeah. Um, well, from that meeting with Germaine Bray, from being, uh, um, you know, drafted into giving that that talk, which was the occasion for my listening to her, which was the occasion of her coming to me and our becoming friends and, and on and on. I, 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 I had the bug at that point and I began thinking, this is something I want to study more, spend my life doing. And I was a teacher, so spending my life doing something was spending my life teaching it. I mean, those were, those were simultaneous. I never taught, in all the years that I taught, I never taught anything I did. Um, want to spend precious time, and I think lifetime, any lifetime is precious time, on. I was, when I was first at Notre Dame, I was taken aside and by one of the older faculty, all the faculty were older, I was 25 or something, 26 when I went to, when I taught at Notre Dame first, first year, taken aside and said, you know, the things you're teaching and the things you're writing about, you know, you're not going to be able to 
build a career around those, you know, because that's not what's hot today. That's not, that's not yeah. what people are talking about. And he said, if you want to publish, I had published a couple of books by then, but they, they, they were, um, they were not selling, um, and weren't getting me anywhere in my career. And he said, you know, if you want to build a career, you have to jump on board, whatever train is moving and moving out and moving fast and jump on and, and uh, you can begin writing reviews of other works, and then in and he, they listed this fellow listed you know the kind of things I could fruitfully write reviews on, and and I said I'm really not interested. I'm not going to spend my time teaching someone who I don't think is, or even reading someone who I don't think will in some way um, enhance my understanding, whatever. So if I think something's foolish or worthless, I'm not going to spend my time on it refuting it or and besides you don't make a career refuting other people for yeah. the most part you you um you flatter them and so i said i'm not interested in a career um i'm interested in teaching and this and you know i label myself a monk practically by saying you know this is a for me this is a calling and and i'm that that's, and so so i I soon knew after that student-funded, student-organized conference that this Camus was someone I wanted to spend my life studying and knowing more about. He was going to be a companion, as it were, in my life. So I wanted to write, um, I mean, to begin to spend more time. And the only way I, as a father of two at that point, um, could spend any more time with someone was to teach them. I, I, I didn't have much time. Uh, after, you know, after f child rearing and between child rearing and and teach and teaching, there wasn't much time left. So if I was going to read something, I teach anyway. Th that's that's uh, I began teaching Camus regularly um, and continued to do that for for you know fifty years. Um, now I learned as much from students as I. You know, as uh, as I learned from my own reading, because it's wonderful. As you know, from St. John's, from the seminars, yeah. um, there's nothing like reading um, communally and sharing ideas communally. And and um, and the students at Hampshire were, you know, were eager for that. And in the beginning at Hampshire, there wasn't a clock in any of the academic buildings. <laughs> You, put, you remember there were no clocks on the walls, and so no, but it, it's it's of a piece. So it, um, <laughs> yeah. it, you know the trains ran very much like most of the trains on the Amtrak. Yeah. You know that they 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 left when they left. They left. They arrived when they arrived. But yeah. who could say when that was going to happen? And um, and that was pretty much the way in those early. Some of my classes would be scheduled. You know, for forty five minutes or fifty minutes. I think. Um, and um, but they would go on for three hours, and they went on. Uh, and of course, not all students stayed for the three hours, but I stayed as long as anyone else stayed. And if there was just one or two people, then we'd walk off together and take this, this class outside and go for a walk, and still be, but still be talking. And so, um, in those kinds of, of, of sharings, I understood how. Uh, well, first of all, the. the None of the none of my other classes um, ignited that kind of of enthusiasm, of commitment, of I mean, the Camus mattered to them, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's why they you know they they were the way that the students at Notre Dame listening to Germaine Bure, but I wouldn't compare myself with her, but she was talking about Camus and so was I, and it was about Camus rather than Germaine Bure or myself. Um, and Germain, I invited Germain to come and speak at the college, and and then, you know, and then lead a, a discussion, whatever, whatever we were discussing at that point, and things. And she was taken by the students, um, and um, you know, by how how much they cared, how much how penetratingly, perceptively they thought about Camus' work, and we. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we sometimes acted out his plays, 
and and so on. But anyway, she she said, next time I'll come for free. Um, and she was, I don't know what her ordinary honorarium at that point would be, but but it was uh, it was not gratis. And and she said, this is wonderful. You know what, these students are wonderful. And and she. Um, so that went on for years and years, and the, and and as you know, Augustine said that the you know the, the um, he said the Bible is like a a um, is like a you know a, a rivulet or a stream, and he said the books grow as you grow. Um, referring to the books of the Bible, yeah. that they grow as you grow. And um, and I think that uh, I would say that with respect to the body of to Camus' books, not the, you know, the word for Bible, Biblia is actually plural for book, it's yeah. books. And and so so the, the Biblia, the Camus' Bible made of many books grows when as you grow, um, you find Whatever it, what Augustine said, you know, was whatever truth you discover from life, you will find those truths expressed and so on in 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 the Bible. So I think that people, as they're obviously through the Vietnam years, it's different from the Iraq years, and and um, and God knows the the Trump years, years short for. Uh, we hope, and um, so I, I think, and so I partially taught Kimu because it, was, it, 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 it was so delightful to do. I always looked forward to that class because, and students looked forward to it. And most classes at Hampshire, as you know, were like what, twelve, fifteen, six, yeah. one, 10? one conference table. -ish. Yeah, one conference yeah. table. Well, some of my Kimu cl classes were taught in the main lecture hall. And I had, you know, well over a hundred students, mm -hmm. um, and now that ebbed over time. I mean, um, that that's for sure. I aged over time, um, and the um, but I think I was always impressed with this. The students I've stayed in touch with, a lot of them that I'm still in closely in touch with and admire greatly. You know, our graduate, the graduates now graduates, formerly my students, um, you know, they, they still say that that was, that they sort of lived with Camus, um, and um, that he's, he's been helpful to them um, in, more than helpful, he's been a companion, basically, because you know, as a, as a prolific reader of, 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 Every you know, of, of, of great <laughs> literature, and maybe I know from your reading mine not so great literature. There's, <laughs> there's, you know, from your from your reading, you know that 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 um, um, the, uh, how books expand your mind and and equip you for life, talk to you in life. You gain courage from them. You gain consolation and sometimes hope. I mean, they're they're your companions. Well, Camus was a companion. Mm -hmm. And remains a companion for many of my students, and certainly for me. So, um, which of his that's books? Why I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no. So, which of his works did you have to grow into? The fall. Yeah. The one. You know, I, I always wonder about you know, the the books that happen yeah. to be waiting for us when we get older. Yeah, I, yeah. I've cited it in the show a million times. The Leopard by Lampedusa sat on my shelf for 10 years before I read it. And luckily I read it in my forties instead of my thirties, because if I read it in my thirties, I wouldn't have grasped what was at stake, yeah. not for a, a member of the royalty, but for a middle-aged man watching yeah. his, his yeah. world pass by in my forties. It really, really worked for me. And I go back to it every couple of years, but, um, but I wonder that with, with Camus, which books really, you know, even when though you're reading them in your twenties and thirties, which ones you know took to your forties, fifties, and later? Well, certainly, the, certainly the fall. Yeah, I, I didn't know quite what to do with that mm -hmm. um, for a number of years, and I don't think it, I don't think it reached or touched my students. It's, 
like some of the other works. Mm -hmm. um, the um, what really caught me off guard, and which I never would have appreciated early on, was the speech, the human crisis, because yeah. I've only in recent years come upon that, and I thought, oh my God, you know, that really speaks to me now. This is this is prophetic. Do you think um, it would have affected you had you read it thirty or forty no, years ago? No. Okay. Yeah. If I hadn't worked with w for many many years with with um, the people I've worked with in you know in in the VA and with um, the veterans various groups veterans or veterans groups and former combatants and former um, ex prisoners in Northern Ireland and um, the. It, it, if I hadn't lived the life I've lived and, and yeah. gotten to know the people I've gotten to know, I never, it, it wouldn't have had any of the residents. It might have had some, but very little. Uh, More intellectual than, than. Yeah, than, absolutely. Than absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and clearly, you know, Camus, my objection to philosophy <clears throat> was, um, was that philosophy had become. By the time I began to study it, it had become a parlor game. Um, mm -hmm. It was, um, to some extent, my study of classics the same way. The classics, not the classics, not Aristotle, or, or yeah. not, and certainly not Euripides. Or, but classics as an institution. As a, of as a, as a yeah. discipline. Um, I once described it as... as it's, Classics conferences and meetings as sherry and razor blades. Um, <laughs> that, you know, people are on the one hand cordial with one another, you know, in their tweeds and their and sipping sherry, but they're, you know, they're, they're cutting each other without with, and the, you, wounds, flicking wounds that will only bleed a little later. <laughs> And um, you know, trying to put other people down. And oh, one of my St. John. She was a undergrad when I was in the the grad school. Zena Hits. I had her on last year. She's a tutor now at St. Mm -hmm. John's, but she wrote about her pre St. John's academic career in much the same light that you know that sort of cordiality and everything she had from St. John's turned into this merciless backbiting and, and you know, backstabbing yeah. once she yeah. was out, out in academia otherwise, and then coming back to St. John's realizing, oh, it doesn't have to be like that. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it really, it's, yeah. it's, it's shameful. Um, I, I was invited um, once and then re-invited after, afterwards a second time, but the first time I was invited by Yale to come and teach a course on Camus. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and this was a course for which students were not, it was a credit course, they would get credits, but um, people were not, I mean, wouldn't necessarily get credit towards their major. Mm -hmm. It was, a, it was uh, you know, an interdisciplinary, I was, they connect me with the philosophy department, but I had, um, I, I had no, I, I never had any dealings with the philosophy department while I was there. But they were initially shocked by the number who applied. I mean, they, they, um, and of course they knew absolutely nothing about me. And if they had, it wouldn't influence them either. It was Camus, and and um, they had, um, they put out a. I was only allowed to, I think, have something like twelve or fourteen students in the class. I said it was limited to that. The seminar, you cannot admit. I said, well, what? People want to audit it. Absolutely not. This is, you know, rules is rules. Yeah. And and um, so, and they said, they they had each student, prospective student, each applicant write essays, and that really made my life difficult because I was amazed by at the essays mm -hmm. they were writing. Um, extraordinary students, and they were very really thought about why they wanted to study Camus. Um, and I begged them, the officials, you know, to, uh, I said, it won't bother me, I, I, you know, the more the merrier. And they said, no, 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 this is, the, this is what, this kind of seminar has only this number of students. So I admitted them and I asked them um, the first day or two of, of class, well, why? 
this surge of applicants and um, and they said we're starving um, a lot of them were philosophy majors and one of them told me and another was a literature major I don't really remember what kind of literature but um, what they said was we in high school you know when we were young before we went to college we loved this literature or philosophy more than anything else and they I it's what I wanted to spend my life with um, and then they said that uh, when they came to Yale and there's a lot of good people <laughs> yeah I don't a know lot of good good things school down, Yale. But yeah, um, yeah. and 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 I can certainly say though to anyone at Yale or who went to Yale Yale has certainly amazing students I found they were um, they were amazing in a different way from the Hampshire students, but boy, were they prepared and hardworking and, and so on. Um, <clears throat> of course, I only have those that slice who came to my class, but um, they they said, you know, that we're starving, and and they said there's so much and antagonism and rivalry and competition and. So much that has nothing to do with literature and nothing to do with with um, uh, with philosophy, and then when we begin discussing these things, they, you know, they they all die on the table. These organisms, these living organisms, these yeah. living, breathing, bleeding uh, organisms, these books of philosophy, books of literature, um, they die on the table. You know, they and uh, we're the way we dissect them, the way we take them apart, the way we demythologize and decompose or whatever them, um, there's nothing left. And and I said, well, where, where does this go? And they, they both of them said, um, they have taught me, this experience has taught me to hate what I once loved most. And the one thing I knew would of what leads from here it won't have anything to do with philosophy or literature, and um, I thought, you know, this is this is a real success, as 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 Clement says, a real a real clean up job. Um, I had to give and, a speech at Hampshire, um, two thousand two. So uh, nine years after I graduated, uh, Jeff Wallen asked me to come in uh, as part of a publishing mm -hmm, panel mm -hmm, and, and mm -hmm. speak and. At that point, uh, still trade magazine editorial work, business to business stuff, and I, I got up and I, I said, you know, whatever you're really interested in, don't make that like the sole course of study mm -hmm. here, because mm -hmm. even if you get a job in that field, you're going to hate it within five years, and you're going to move on to something completely different than anything you studied here. So, study broad. You know, I told them my my St. John's thing, which was learn how to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. just just stay open like that. I understand there are areas you need to be focused, you know, uh, hyper specifically. Absolutely. But, but in a lot of a lot of ways, not not necessarily Hampshire, but the other world beats that out of you. Um, and that it's it's at least you know from my my yeah. dilettante yeah. Uh, world, it's it's you know it's good to have these things, but also you know to be able to, to keep adjusting on the fly. Which, as I said before we started, I am the only Hampshire grad who can say he's a registered lobbyist <laughs> for the pharmaceutical industry. So maybe my words shouldn't be taken with too much too much credit. But yeah, I, you know, I, I believe I, that. I as a classicist, I'm not a classicist any more than I'm a, a French scholar in the sense that the I haven't focused my my whole life on the in develop, building a career, um, but certainly spent a lot of my life studying and writing about those. I've taken part in you know classical conferences like at Oxford, mm -hmm. and I have to say that you know that that the um, some of the sessions I sat in on it in those in those conferences were um, made Yale. Look like a Quaker meeting by comparison, <laughs> uh, yeah. and and I just—it's such a waste. It's such a it's such a terrible waste. Um, well, I mean, I'll, I'll, but in the, yeah. positively, yeah. those students were absolutely great, and 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 Camus fired them. You know, they just they and they said when we thought we were going to study when we came to study literature, came to study. Um, 
uh, philosophy, this is this is what I wanted to do. You know, this, yeah. these are the the kind of works I wanted to read and think about and live with and and discuss with the others about. You yeah. Know? And and this is um, in Hampshire for for the time that I was there. You know, they sometimes against great obstacles, primarily financial obstacles, that because we were the poor, the pauper of the five colleges, mm -hmm. um, the poor fifth child of the five colleges. And, and so we, we tried to do more with less. It's tough. I mean, when I was there, I went to UMass to study Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Because at Hampshire, we had Shakespeare's treatment of women, but we didn't have Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah, you know, that, and that's a story that I unfortunately have told too often over the, the years. And I think I look now, and I think I'm, I'm unfair towards the school in some respects. I studied Dostoevsky and Tolstoy under Joanna Hubbs, yes, but I studied Joyce over at Amherst because there just wasn't enough uh, yeah, offerings. Yeah. I again should have taken your class then instead of taking Sense and Spirit, which I got something out of it. I'm not 100 percent sure what, but I'm glad you neither actually, did I. Good. There is the <laughs> the moment you cite near the end of this book that is one of the things I took away from your Sense and Spirit course, which was the Greek Hellenic perspective on on time, mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. how we're walking backwards into the future in mm -hmm. a sense that that you know to them what you can see is the past and and what the future is is unseen as opposed to our whole you know blindly yes, yes. you know stomping forth into the future. Um, that image has stuck with me since yeah. 1992, I guess. So consider that a success. Oh, good. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, when I teach the Iliad, that's that's crucial because yeah. the uh, you know Achilles, who oh, nearly oh, I have a lot about Achilles to talk nearly about with outruns you. death. I mean, he's, yeah. he's as close as you can get as immortal to immortality or to invulnerability, yeah. but he's he's swift-footed Achilles because death is approaches not from the front, yeah, you're, but from behind. And uh, because the future is behind you. To veer into, well, it, this does tackle the moral injury thing, which I, yeah. I plan on getting to. Um, my suspicion or my reading of the fourth time I, I was going through the Iliad is that Achilles is not just the only one who knows his fate, but that no one else can understand Achilles when he talks about his fate that there are instances where they repeat every line of a speech that he gives, and yet everything about his fate is left out. And Patroclus asks him at one point, do you know something about your fate you're not telling us? Even though he was in the room when, when Achilles is speaking to the envoy about how he knows he's going to die if he stays there, and how he can go back and live a, a quiet life if he leaves. Um, the way I put this is... In my 20s, and we talk about how we grow into mm -hmm, books, mm -hmm. Achilles was a douchebag. He was just this, you know, petulant, arrogant, super warrior, but, you know, somebody who was almost one-dimensional to me. And in my 40s, rereading it, it was, he has a father and a son that he's never going to see again. I somehow never noticed them getting mentioned until this time around. Mm -hmm. And that he knows the cost of the war that he knows his fate when none of the other ones do. And that, as we see in the Odyssey, which you can debate whether or not it's, you know, Homer is Homer, you know, he's still petulant about it, even though he knows he's going to be the center of a poem that's, that's mm -hmm. you know, one of the centers of the Western world, that it wasn't worth it. That, that you know, another day of living or maybe having been a, a farmer back in his, his home would have been preferable to... to dying on the battlefield and being the center of the Iliad. Not exactly a question, but, you know, it's that sense of what war meant even then, that even if you knew that you were going to be glorified and, and gratified, that it still wasn't worth it, and that the, the grief is still going to, to overcome you. Um, as I read some of your work on moral injury and what it means to a contemporary soldier who's nowhere near an Achilles, uh, it seems that no one is prepared even when you know what, what's coming, that, that this puts you in a world that you could never have envisioned, I guess. Well, my reading of, of, um, of the Iliad and the Odyssey have everything to do with um, 
with the experience of war. Not that I have experienced war. I mean, mm -hmm. I was I, I was a war resistor, not a war, not a <clears throat> infantry soldier. Uh, one question also with the draft: Were you just age ineligible, or was it your teaching that kind of were you subject to? The well, draft I wasn't teaching at the time. I was a graduate student at okay. the University of Chicago. I don't uh, know if you had deferments or if you just got lucky with with draft numbers. Oh, or is there something else you want to tell us about this? No, no, no. <laughs> well, um, there's a, there's a. We'll talk about that story. story. Separately. But okay. it's just that I reached a point where, I, you know, the lottery was introduced, yeah. and um, and my number was very bad. So my number was coming up. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, the odds of my being drafted in the next whatever number of weeks or months was very, very high. Uh, at that point, uh, there was no such thing as conscientious ob objector unless you knew somebody if you were Catholic, because the Catholics, um, the Catholic view on war was the official view and, and still, you know, the, um, uh, the traditional view is the just war theory. I mean, the, the you know, the Catholic Church is is aligned with the just war theory. It's one of the pillars of, of and the just war theory is taught in national academies. I mean, all of our um, armed services academies in Annapolis, West Point, and so on, the Air Force Academy, they're all taught the just war theory. Um, Obama, before he ordered a, a, yeah. every targeted stri a drone strike, um, every, every targeted killing, he said he went back to the... Um, to the just to Aquinas and Augustine and 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 um, and checked what he was doing against their measure of what a just what a just more theory permitted. Um, so there was anyway there was no opt no, no way that I could have gotten conscientious objector status. My brother at that point was in Vietnam at the first cavalry um, as an infantry soldier um, and. So I was trying to face whether I would go to prison or go to war. I mean, go to prison or go to Canada, rather. Um, it was one or the other. And there are all sorts of personal stories with respect to my brother and my, and my mother, who uh, at the time was, this was, um, which made this increasingly difficult for me to go to Canada or to go to prison, um, as going to war also would have been... <laughs> Not something that they wanted me to do, but anyway, I um, I had a number of friends at the University of Chicago, close friends, um, and um, we were all debating one night when or whether we before we went to prison or to Canada should we burn our draft cards and so on. And um, and now I'm I'm. I'm blanking on his name, but I knew him. Um, um, he was at, he was one of the national leaders of the anti-war movement. He was at at the Riverside Church in in, in New York. Um, he was a chaplain at Columbia. Um, He's an iconic name from the '60s, and I know it as well as I. Uh, the only thing that's coming to mind is Abby Hoffman, who is so totally not the right person here. So. Oh no, not no, at all. This no. this was yeah. this was along with Abraham Heschel and Thomas yeah, Merton I, I, and yeah. and Daniel Berrigan and so on. He was one of those figures that was one of the most outspoken um, uh, public figures, eloquent public figures, preaching against the war. And uh, he happened to be speaking at the University of Chicago. We invited him to come to this apartment. It was the apartment of one of my friends who, you know, um, and we sat up all night talking with him. And because he was, he was, he was, I don't want to say an authority, he was a moral authority hmm. for people trying to figure out how to resist the war. Um, and he said, don't go to prison and don't go to Canada if you have any way out. Go clean for Jean. Uh, you know, uh, join the you know join the um, the the unseat Johnson campaign, and um, you know and try to elect Jean McCarthy. 
Robert Kennedy wasn't in the running at that point. He, yeah. Anyway, um, there was still the problem of how could I stay <laughs> free from the military and out of prison and not yet in Canada. How could I do that long enough to work for Gene McCarthy? Well, um, my draft board gave me a uh, continued my clerical exemption. 4D is four for way down there, mm-hmm. for not 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 a, not vulnerable to being drafted or for military. Um, so it's, it's a complete deferment. And the D was for divinity, uh, divinity students or divinity, yeah. you know, clerics of every sort, rabbis and and imams, whatever you were you were exempt from the draft. So they 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 kept my. After I left the religious community that I had belonged to, they kept my divinity. They still had me certified for, as 40, even though I knew I was a student, or that, or as public knowledge, as it were, that, that I was a student at the University of Chicago, a graduate student. So I decided um, I'll go with that, and and um, and I went and worked for Gene McCarthy. And, I the rest is with, history. Yeah, uh, I, did, I did a show with a screenwriter who just put out a memoir recently about all of his years of dodging the draft back in the 60s. Yeah, He's about 80 yeah, years old also. Yeah. Um, and eventually he gets drafted or shows up the the draft board. And apparently, uh, I think his uncle's connection to the Communist Party once upon a time, which he just mentions because they ask him, you know, you have to answer all these questions. Yeah. And yes, I do have a family connection to the, the Communist Party. They throw him out on the spot. And that was his... You tell me I could have done this five years ago. <laughs> Avoided all of this crap. I almost got married. I almost ran to Canada. Yeah, I almost yeah, did yeah, this and that. Yeah. yeah. So had he known, he could have just, uh, you know. But anyway, so I'm glad you didn't serve. But back to the Iliad, um, the experience well, of war. F- uh, from that point on, I began working, you know, with with, with veterans and uh, special and anti-war, uh, and of course, the. Um, some of my some of the most powerful influential veterans that are, are rather allies in the anti-war movement were veterans mm-hmm. veterans against the war john Kerry and yeah. and others the um uh because they knew what they were talking about they had come back and 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 thrown their medals uh yeah you know over the at the pentagon walls and so on this was um and, and so, you know, in all the work that I've done with veterans over the years, I've, I've, they, all that work has convinced me that one of the, if not the, um, strongest force that may one day lead our country out of its incessant addiction to warfare will be veterans. Um, and, um, so I, I've I've listened rather than endured war myself. I've listened and listened and listened um, over the years, as veterans have told their stories to me, and as I've worked and gotten to know them, and they've taken me into t- their confidence to, you know, to to share their experiences. And um, I know it said, you know, the slogan during. Vietnam and afterwards was, if you didn't go, you don't know. I mean, there's no way for anyone who hasn't experienced war to understand it, to know it. Well, you never know it in that way. That's that's absolutely sure. But what, what do we have imaginations for? I mean, what do we have literature for? Uh, if you, if, if it's, it's to allow us to share our experiences and the more, the fuller that sharing, the fuller uh, the understanding our our understanding expands beyond our actual experiences and and i just dis- i discovered that to be to be true i would ne- any time i've given talks or worked with a new group of veterans or whatever i say right away i i you know i resisted the war i didn't i never went to to vietnam i have no experience of war but i've listened a long time and i'll, I'll listen to you you know basically um and uh so when you read the Iliad after hearing countless war stories, you understand, duh, that it's about war, <laughs> and that and that Achilles is is a berserker, 
um, he's um, he's suicidal. He his closest one of his closest comrades has to sleep beside him at night. Yeah. I mean, holding holding his arms so that he he won't take his blade into his hands and kill himself. I mean, um, I was obviously, I mean, in retrospect, I mean, um, you know, influenced deeply by Jonathan Shea. I don't know if that name means anything to you, but Jonathan Shea is, um, he coined the phrase moral injury. Oh yeah. I recall and, the, the, the site about the, the book, the website about your work on yeah. moral injury. And, and Jonathan Shea wrote two books that are now classics, um, in, in, in veteran work and among veterans, they are classics. And he is, you know, widely, widely esteemed and revered by, by veterans. And he wrote two books, Achilles in Vietnam, which is about the Iliad mm. and, um, and Odysseus in America. Achilles in Vietnam is about, is about the experience of combat and, and, and seeing Achilles as a combat soldier and, uh, Odysseus in America is about the return from war, the long return for war. Why does it take decades for many veterans to make it home, yeah. to get home? Um, we still, from working in the VA in, in uh, the, the Western and Central Massachusetts VA, up in outside of Northampton, Massachusetts, in Leeds, that's a massive VA complex there. I think they serve something like 50,000 veterans um, not resident there, but outpatients and, and, and so on that, and in their other facilities throughout Massachusetts, West central and Western Massachusetts. And, you know, they still had veterans coming in from the forests of new England to the VA, um, you know, five, 10 years ago, they were still, they were still coming in. They've been out there for 10, 20, 30 years living um, in tents or abandoned buildings or in abandoned cars or whatever they've been been living um, and now they're coming home you know they're going because they're you know they're in their they're at that time in their late 60s 70s 80s um, and um, they, they needed the care that only the VA you know, the, the VA offered them they didn't have health insurance or anything else you know they didn't have an income so anyway they um, why does it take so the Odysseus in America is about Odysseus' long return home. And uh, so I, I've learned, um, Jonathan Shea and I became close friends about 26 years ago. We, we began working together and so on. And uh, he helped me write my book, Killing from the Inside Out. You know, he went over the whole manuscript with me and so on. But mostly I, I just have... Um, in our friendship and 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 work and learning from him um the i've learned to reread i mean to see the the uh, you know the um Ily and the odyssey um as in in immediate as a ter- you know wonderfully illuminating horribly illuminating of of the experience of 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 coming home from war going to war and and so on, uh, but the way that he got into that, he's not a classicist. Um, he learned a bit of Greek on his own um, in order to work on on the Iliad and so on. And he, uh, but he was a psychiatrist for many years in the severe post traumatic stress syndrome clinic in Boston, uh, run by the VA. He was a VA psychiatrist, and he worked with with those patients who just didn't get well, as it were, mm-hmm. who, um, who were suffering for years and years. And he believed that veterans heal veterans, um, that he was there basically to facilitate their healing of each other. Um, he didn't, was very, very slow to bring take out his RX pad. He didn't get much business to pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. Um, he, he believed that... Uh, that telling, sharing their stories, he, he, what he called communalization was the, was the, um, was the key to recovery. 
and he believed as well, and I, I'm convinced of this too, that that was the point of, of Greek tragedy um, in the theater. And, and that's another conversation probably. But, the, uh, but what he did, he, he, these veterans are very reluctant to tell their, 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 their stories, and especially those moments, those episodes that are, are at the heart of their wound, at the very, you know, the, yeah. the, the part that they still can't face themselves. And, and only by sharing that with, with, with other veterans, he thought, would they somehow be able to, to recover as much as recovery was possible. And, but you have to sort of prime the pumps, as it were. You have to, um, to not immediately look around and say, well, who's going who's gonna to talk first? Who's going to tell yeah. their story first or whatever? So let's share stories that, that, that you can in one way or another identify with and, um, and see your story in their story, in the, in, the, in the literature or whatever you're reading. So he tried a whole bunch of different things to read um, that they could read together and discuss in the hope that it would bring out, that it would lead to to um to storytelling among themselves well what of all things brought it out was the iliad he said immediate and they told him homer gets it he you know he <laughs> yeah. he really gets it that's that and then they identified with achilles and some of the others as uh, other warriors and so on in the some of the other characters in it and that that just opened them up and and as far as the struggles of homecoming that they were including including jugs and and you know odysseus um contemplates suicide over and over in the in 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 yeah. in, the, in the odyssey and so on. so his 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 suicide his um um uh, Holding off, yeah. killing himself. He said, "I had to hold myself back from just rolling over the side of the boat and yeah. and drowning." And so, and so, all of the things, the drugs, the you know, the lotus eaters, and right. so all of the various things that Odysseus is um, is the part of his story is they saw their own um, incomplete failure to return, their incomplete homecoming. And what was holding them up, um, blocking them? And so they saw it all reflected in the Odyssey. So those two books were transformative for those veterans, and um, and so <clears throat> that was the whole f basis of the literature and medicine war story project that I worked on in the VA and the National Endowment for for a number of years. It puts me in mind also of of Hector when he comes back home and, and the baby is crying and, and screaming and he realizes he has to take his helmet off yeah. and, and, you know, not be the warrior in front of his family. And that's gotta be, well, I mean, I, I forwarded you the one that I, I recorded with the English professor at West Point, a mm -hmm. civilian, yes, uh, yes. Elizabeth Samet and her second book on the soldier's heart. Um, and she talks about some of the grads, students of hers who went on to serve in, in Afghanistan and Iraq mm -hmm. and then coming back late twenties, early thirties and nothing in this world in America matches just the adrenaline and everything else they were undergoing. So these yeah. guys are all yeah. riding motorcycles, 140 miles yeah. an hour yeah. trying to absolutely live up to, to something that, you know, they experienced at the yeah. peak of their lives and, yeah. you know, beyond the, atrocities that may have occurred during that time also just the the heightened experience of living that mm -hmm. one then has mm -hmm. to uh, to pass i yeah. guess yeah yeah and it's clearly france was traumatized yeah. um, when they were liberated it wasn't in, they had to return to something like normal although although camus was convinced that that normal was not good enough. The normal they had left behind was partly responsible for what, what they exactly had endured, they ended up exactly what happened, and, yeah. and that there had to be a, a, re, a revolution. There had to be yeah. um, a, a change in, in radical change in French life, French government. 
and so on. Do you speculate what happens if he doesn't die? I mean, Algeria gets resolved a year or two after, but, you know, where his art or thought would have gone had he lived. I'm not sure that... That's a really good question. Uh, and it's of a piece with that it's question a, about yeah. modeling his, his... Oh, absolutely. You know, his, his entire work. Uh, and again, you, yeah. you said he yeah. added that, yeah. that fourth... Well, he was convinced that his literary career hadn't really begun, that yeah. he had nearly achieved what he wanted to achieve, not just in, in number of words or books or uh, whatever, but he hadn't... His great work lay ahead of him. And yeah. I think that's true of reading the... The um, the draft of the very first section of of the first man, yeah. and that's all we have. That that he had that in his briefcase uh, in the car from which he and the briefcase flew. You know, were projected when they hit that plane tree uh, at high speed. The um, so I think his his literary career would have taken off. I didn't know it was a plane tree, by the way, but that creates a Phaedrus analog, too, in case it's death by metaphor. Yeah, no, the, but go on. The French have another name for it, don't they? Or, or is it that um, it's, there's another tree here that is, in fact, what they call a plane tree, I guess, in Europe. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yes, yeah. he um, and because of recent testimony and recent being in the last 10 years, testimony by former KGB people, it, it, it's quite possible he was assassinated, you know, that that. Um, but that's that will never be known, yeah. and in some ways it doesn't matter. Um, it's just that um, the FBI never needn't had anything to fear from Camus as a communist, um, and you know the uh, that's what they were concerned about. One thing reason he was held when they tried when to get in in 1946 in yeah. that Hoover was uh, who misspelled his name um, was. Um, he was concerned that he was a philosopher and, and that he was French and that he was communist. Uh, he was, in fact, he couldn't deny being French and he was, he did write philosophy, but, um, by that time he had, he had long left the communist party. And so, uh, he event reached the point, Camus did that, that, that he considered, uh, at that point, S Stalinist, Russia, Soviet communism was the greatest threat the world faced. I mean, he wouldn't feel that way probably now, but but not that he would have cozied up to them either. Uh, to, to I don't think he would have been, you know, in Putin's pocket or yeah. or in his drinking club or whatever at all. Uh, but anyway, I think um, I think his literary career would have taken off. I think he had, in some way, ceased to be relevant on the political level. Um, the world was moving clearly. France was moving. The world was moving in a direction that didn't want to hear and didn't feel they ne had anything to learn from from what he was saying about politics hmm. and so on. And and he he said the world disgusted him and the governmental world, the political world, disgusted him and he was going to leave that. Um, he had gone into seclusion as it were, over the Algerian crisis because um, he had been so vocal for so many years and then went, when Sartre and so many others, all of France were vocal on both sides, he, 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 he had nothing to say because the discussion was, both were advocating violence and, and terrorism and torture and, and so on, and he just had nothing to say in that world where that was convinced that the other side only understood violence and and that's the only thing that would bring them to the table and bring them to defeat the, the only way to achieve anything in this world is 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 through superior arms and superior violence and he doesn't have anything to say to that world except stop um so i think his political uh his political world i mean his political influence his position in the world as a public spokesman would have been um, he would have been more like Noam Chomsky than, than, um, and some people would have listened. Mm -hmm. Some people wouldn't. Some people would read his political writing that he never wrote, but would write yeah. the way that people read Chomsky.
don't you think? I mean, he has a readership, certainly, but but not the ear of the world. No, uh, no. And it's it's yeah, it's that self not self selecting, but it's a silo, I guess. Yeah, you know. I mean, he was at the center of things. Yeah, for a number of years, and he, he he's clearly on the peripheral and moving further into the mm. periphery. Do you um, think artistically he would have satisfied? His his model. Yeah, his I do, dreams. I do. Yeah. But where do you go from the Nobel Prize? I mean, he wouldn't win. Uh, you can't yeah. win the Nobel Prize twice, can you? For literature? I hope not. Yeah, because uh, then I'm, I'm I'm even farther behind now. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> it did make me wonder. I have to go look what the average age of Nobel recipients are because I have a feeling it's trended higher, older. Uh, as, yes, as the years well, have gone except by. for Malala. Yeah. Yes, well, no, I mean, for, for a Nobel uh, literary Oh, prize. literature, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah I feel so like that's, that's headed more, more towards uh, lifetime more achievement. For life achievement, exactly. You know? And he was very, he was one of the, I think he was the second youngest when he, yeah, 40 he was given something. it. Yeah, um, 42 or 44. Yeah, yeah, something like that. So tell me about retirement. I only retired in the middle retired. of a pandemic. Oh, okay, you retired from Hampshire. I'm, um, so I took that as retirement, but... Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. a professor in waiting. Ah, Okay. All right. No, Professor, I, I never too. intended to retire. No. I never intended to retire. It, 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 circumstances that are probably not worth going into um, made me resign my position. I, didn't, I never submitted my retirement, or ah, okay. uh, I simply resigned from my teaching a friend, position. A friend asked me uh, a week or so ago whether I was getting close to retirement. Yes, which is a sign that I took as she thinks I make more money than I currently make. Yeah. She thinks I'm older than I am, which can't be right because we're both about 50. Or her standards of living are so low that she thinks, you know, what I make is enough to retire on. But at, at 50, that is <laughs> not the case. Good. No, and not yeah. in the slightest. And, and, so, but again, uh, retired or professor in waiting then. What's the, uh, uh, how does it feel compared to? Oh, I don't like it. Uh, well, I, I, um, you asked again, your very first question, how did, how did, how did this book unfold? Well, I never intended at this point to write um, to write a book on Camus. I'd already written one, mm -hmm. and um, Germaine Bray, whom I mentioned earlier, um, was very helpful in that. I was all I was puzzled, uh, as the world was puzzled, uh, by um, where Camus was going when he died. At that point, the first man ha had not been released. Publicly, she had read, I believe, been allowed to read portions of it uh, because she was very close to the family. As I mentioned, his wife was he had yeah. she had introduced his his wife. They were very close, uh, Francine Four and and who was a mathematics professor, um, I think, in the same university that Germaine taught in in um, in Oran, and um, but she. I, I I didn't know how to end the book. I'm, once I got past the fall and the um, exile in the kingdom, those stories, I thought, well, where is this going? And, of course, the world was wondering why, where this was going um, after his, his fatal accident. And I didn't know how to interpret some of the old, the oldest, I mean, the his latest, I should say, Works and so she said, "Well, come down and and we'll talk about it." She, she opened her house, and I lived in her house for a while with her. And she would, we'd have conversations at night. She was still teaching, and um, and she really helped me with that. Um, so that that was my book on Camus, as it were. But it was written when I was a kid, almost, and and I I had learned ever so much more um, and understood so much more that when I abruptly left teaching, left my that teaching position, I, I thought, well, what am I going to do? Um, I, I was very fearful of, of, of COVID. Um, at that point, there wasn't a vaccine. There really wasn't the prospect of a vaccine. Uh, we were having high numbers um, here in Connecticut. Remember, that was one of the first, after the West Coast, after... Oh, it was New York, uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts. Yes, uh, we, were, was, we were the hot zone at nightmare. that point. And yeah. I thought, you know, I'm, um, I have no opportunity. I did, in fact, you know, continue teaching f for a semester. And then I 
worked with students and their theses for another year, but um, but the, I wasn't going to go back into the classroom, and I, I sort of um, detested online teaching. I did teach one semester of online courses, and I taught Camus on, you know, and and um, you know, it's like taking a shower uh, with your parka on. You know, it yeah. was uh, it just wasn't the experience that that a hot shower is uh, provides, and so I I, I thought, well, I, I'm going to teach, but I'm going to teach by writing. You know, I'm going to teach on paper. Well, what do I want to teach? And I was a little melodramatic about it. First of all, what am I most excited? Ex- what am I most excited about teaching? And um, because it hadn't been that long before, after I had discovered the first, the the, the human crisis, that speech. Um, so I, I thought, well, of all the things to write about, that I would most get excited about writing about. And I needed excitement at that point. I mean, being basically locked down. And I said, well, it's Camus, is, is, is it? And, I, and then I thought, well, I could die of this. I'm with, I was 76 at that point. Um, and I thought, and I had, you know, I had complications like um, kidney disease and various hypertension and so on. Not, not a, uh, I thought, you know, I could very well die of this. It, nothing was under control. I thought, well, what do I want to leave? You know, what? Yeah. What? And I thought, and it gave me, I thought, if I could just finish this book, and this is where the melodramatic, you know, this is where it, we need theme music here. <laughs> uh, yeah. I thought, you know, what note do I want to uh, uh, play as I'm on my deathbed or whatever, you know, I just, I, I thought, you know, this, I, yeah. I, I thought to myself, well, this is, <clears throat> this is my last class. I thought of it as my last class. And so I wanted to put my heart into it the way you would. Hmm. And I have a very funny story to break the, the tension here or the, <laughs> the, the melodrama. Um, I got to know this, this, um, um, this fellow at the university of South Carolina who, um, was very renowned in that university, a poet, and he wrote a number of books. He translated a number of books by by Rumi, and he was um, he he had taught fifty years at that point, and he was retiring. I think it was fifty, a good round, you know, um, significant number. He was retiring, and his last class was approaching. So he thought about that last class for for the whole last semester. Yeah. Um, the very last class section th- that he would give. And, um, well, the short of it is he overslept. <laughs> <laughs> he thought about it so hard and kept himself up night after night thinking about it. And he overslept and he was horrified. So he wrote a poem called My Last Class uh, because he was a poet. And um, th- th- I wanted not to sleep through my last class, much less die through my last class. I wanted to make it there and be able to do it the way that I could feel good about. And now the question is, what do I live for? I'm just laughing. That, that's, no, no, um, but that, that's the, uh, the where sort of from question. here. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I have other, other books I could write. Um, um, I, I would, you know, I would in, enjoy teaching Kimu again. Uh, into a classroom of students. Um, there's lots of things. I, the 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 work with moral injury is ongoing. Yeah. And and I have, right now, I'm shut shut out of the VA because you know they're they're in crisis, right. and um, and they're not open to casual visitors. Not that my work there is casual, but no, I'm an outsider. I'm definitely an outsider, yeah. and. Um, and other work with with moral injury, the the people I've worked with in Northern Ireland. I'm I'm not going to take a plane to Ireland at the moment, and you know. So basically, my life, my public life, is sort of shut down, and I don't have immediately anything I, I'm going to to write about. I have to complete this conversation with you and <laughs> a few. I'll take up your <laughs> whole weekend. A few, like a few this, other things. Yeah. Uh, we'll see. I have no idea, mm-hmm. but I'm still here, and I still have many things I, you know, I 
hope to share with others and to, um, you know, and to, but for, because teaching is a matter of learning and um, I want to learn from others and not just from myself and my books and in that little room I showed you. It's pretty extensive, especially <laughs> with the double layers of books on every shelf. So, you know, in fact, we should head back to that so we can get a couple of pictures. My, my pets. Yeah. yeah. That's been my... You know, I, I converted my downstairs into a library. Handyman was there. It's like, oh, this is going to make a really good man cave, and you could put a TV yeah. up here. I was like, no, there's yeah. no TV. Yeah. It's just books. Yeah, it's going to be books, books everywhere. Yeah. And that's... Uh, yeah. But I'm not getting any closer to golfing. Which is good. That's, uh, that's, I don't you know, golf. I, I, yeah. uh, it's a step closer to death, basically. Which I guess is a good final question. Death. Um, uh, given my own, my own preoccupations with that in the last couple of months. How is... Camus in particular, and, and uh, you know, we haven't even gotten into the fact that the book is so suffused with Augustine, an interplay of Augustine and, and Camus. Um, but how has it affected your thoughts on mortality? I mean, you, you came up as a divinity, and we didn't go into your history with theology and divinity and, and mm -hmm, belief in God mm -hmm. and everything else, but um, how has Camus affected your, your approach to mortality, I guess? Well, he was conscious through all his life of of a mortality, and he knew what it meant. Yeah, because he tuberculosis from an early well, age. Well, he he nearly died. I mean, he he yeah. the the prognosis was that he had a slim chance of survival at seventeen. I mean, he was on the verge of death. He was vomiting blood, and and things were not under control at all. And he was in a he was in a, a public hospital that had much to be desired. Um, um, in yeah. Algeria, we'll just in Algiers. Yeah, so. at the time it was it was. I lived and worked for a little while in India, and uh, I I did not want to ever wind up. And I was sick for a while when I was there. I was not going to go into an Indian public hospital. Um, I mean, they have wonderful doctors doing their best, but... The infrastructure it, is lacking. The infrastructure yeah. is yeah. dismally lacking. It may be very different now, but, but that, was, that, was, that was 10 years ago. Um, so I, Camus was convinced that he lived with death all mm -hmm. through his life. You know, as Euripides says, you know, that to be mortal, to be human, you have to think mortal thoughts. He thought mortal thoughts all his life. And he said that, you know, that philosophy, he said, used to teach us how to die. Now it teaches us how to think. And, yeah. and, but the philosophy he taught and the philosophy he wrote was, was all teaching us how to die, I think. And so I've learned from him. Um, first of all, I've never had, I have no illusions about immortality or that, you know, that I live I've always been very, very conscious for many, many years about my own deathfulness, hmm. to use the, the, the Heideggerian, death, Heideggerian yeah. deathfulness, that we, we live and die at the same moment. You know, that if you ask me, am I alive? Yes. Are you, are you, are you living? Well, yes, I am. Are, am I, are you dying? Yes, I am. We're all living and dying at the same, at the same time. Um, and um, I think that... I'm sustained by so many people at my age, at 78. You know, you, most of my friends have died, my closest friends. Mm. Um, and I've seen how they have died. Um, one of my wife's students, um, a young, very young child, um, I saw him die. or saw, uh, We visited him and sat with him. On the day he died, you know, uh, we weren't there when he was actually, when he, his life left him. But um, the courage that he showed and the, um, you know, he would, he, he showed, he was, he was, he was one of the funniest, most playful, um, mischievous and life-loving children you could ever know. And he went into his death the way that you would expect a very wise person to, um, and, uh, you know, the approach to it and everything. And so 
I've had so many examples of, of, of extraordinary courage, vision, hope, you know, in one, one of my very closest friends, um, um, a doctor who had served in Vietnam as a surgeon and so on, he, I had pizza with him the night he died. I mean, he went home and went, was rushed to the hospital in the middle of the night. And, and we had many conversations about, about, he knew he was dying and as did another, because of all my work in theater, I've gotten to know various people in theater. And one of them, an Irishman uh, who worked at the National Theater in, 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 um, and then at the Beckett Center, he was Samuel Beckett's assistant as a young man. Uh, and so on. he's, but, um, I'm belatedly working my way through the novels right now, by the way. <laughs> I took a break for, yeah. for your work, but yeah, I'm in Malone dies at present. But, yeah. But, do we have time for a story? Sure. Or whatever. But, you know, he, he met death. And I don't really know that, I mean, he certainly raised Catholic in Galway, but he was, he was, um, his death was, I don't know what he actually believed about the afterlife. Hmm. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure that people who tell you, they know what the afterlife it's going to be like. I don't listen to that. You know, we we don't know. It's a great unknowing, and the people of of the um, the nuns and priests I know best, you know, would say the same thing that that they, uh, you know, it's a great unknown. Um, and but uh, he called us up. Um, when, when he realized that he was going to be, he was initially given a very short period of time to live. But he then came over, he lived much longer than that period, but, but he said those were the best. He lived for 10 years with AIDS mm -hmm. and at a time when there were no antivirals. Yeah. Um, that was many years ago. And he, um, <clears throat> and so he, he said those were the best 10 years of his life. He said, because every moment was, was rich and full and he appreciated. And he said, I'm the happiest I've ever been. And, and, um, and he said, also, he said, I'm cured. He said, because I was, I was up until now, I was afflicted, as you know, he said, with just paralyzing hypochondria. He said, I'm cured. <laughs> He said, I used to think if I had this bubble, this rash, this cough, this, this or that pain, that it was cancer, it was the brain tumor, it was this or that, and it's going to kill me. Whatever it was from a headache down to a whatever, yeah. it's going to kill me. Now, things I notice, the changes in me, they are going to kill me, and I'm liberated. I don't yeah. have that, I'm not a high contract yeah. anymore. <clears throat> but I remember his, he, he was with us. When uh, my wife and myself, w when he called um, to arrange his funeral, and he called Aer Lingus, um, because <laughs> he was living in London and uh, and he wanted to be buried at the, f in, you know, with his family in Galway, so his body would have to be flown to to um, to Galway. And buried there, and he didn't. He was from a very poor family, financially poor, and so he said he, you know, he, he didn't want to be any expense for them. Uh, it was only his mother at that point and his sisters. So he um, he called up Erlingus, and <laughs> we only heard the one half of the conversation because he was on the phone, and he said, you know, I'd like to book a flight, and well, I don't know when I'm when I'm going to fly. I don't know exactly. <laughs> and they said, uh, you don't. And they, can I buy an open ticket? And they said, well, what kind of ticket are you looking for? Is it first class, second class, uh, you know, in, in economy or whatever? And he said, no, he said, actually, I, I, I will, I'm below all of that. I'll be in the, in the, uh, in the hole or, you know, uh, cargo, uh, cargo. <laughs> I'll be in the cargo hold. I, I will be cargo. And she said, and then there's this long silence. She said, he said, when I fly, which is why I can't tell you when I'm going to fly, I'll be dead. 
and and um and and so I'm booking actually a ticket for my coffin for my remains and then all we heard was oh sweetie don't you don't need to cry it's okay i'm fine with this i'm really just fine with it oh i'm sorry i i'm causing you this and everything she had broken down weeping yeah it was her first day on work oh, at, at as a as a booking agent on the phone for yeah. Aer Lingus, and she was like 18 or 19 years old, and she was undone. Yeah. He, he was trying to just hold herself together. And, uh, and he was, you know, he was at, at peace. Yeah. And um, when, he, when he died, the, the hippie priest, uh, he called him, who, um, who embraced and worked with gay men and w- women in London. Um, the hippie priest was there when he died and said mass on his body. As he, as he, as he died, when he died, he laid out an altar cloth and he said mass on, on Michael's body. Yeah. And there isn't a better death. You know, he, he, he was hilarious, very, you know, a, a um, To his dying death, he uh, dying breath. He was he he was warm and friendly and at peace and and as funny as any Irishman has ever been, and um, and it was all right. So I think you know I I, I mean I'm I, I have religious belief, but I I can't put it. I'm not going to describe what I think awaits me yeah. at all. But I'm I'm not terribly worried um, about. Now that I've got this book written, yeah, <laughs> I, 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 will. I mean, what else? Do, what else is there except well, my my wonderful wife, um, who that that will be break who, my heart. That's been my thing since this summer when my my uh, leukemia diagnosis happened. It was the I'm not distraught. I'm I'm actually okay with the idea of a world going on without me, which I mm-hmm. don't think I would have been capable of. of envisioning or dealing with, you know, uh, maybe 10 years ago, again, person I'll feel worse for is my, my wife who will have to deal. Although I've, yeah. I've put together a whole envelope of, you know, in the event of my death, blah, 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 you know, this, this big yeah. list of everything yeah. it needs taken care of, um, including the guy who cleans the, the gutters and storm drains. But, um, I, I did want to say though, as far as the finishing the book before you die, um, there's a translator I've recorded with who I stayed pal, uh, pals with. And, uh, again, after my diagnosis, she wrote that, um, her way of staving off mortality is to always be under contract yeah. <laughs> as long as there is another deadline, translation commission deadline, yep. other than the deadline. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the final one, but her whole thing is like, I, I just had this weird belief that as long as there is another commission ahead of me, I can't die because the publisher yeah. will come yeah. after me. So you know, there, there, he you won't may, be in any hurry to come after her, though. Right, true, but you may um, want to commit to another book before uh, before too absolutely. long. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so, and I will make another trip up here to uh, to sit down and, oh, and talk very, with you very about good. it. Very good. And we'll we'll go into all the other stuff. Uh, you know, classics, India, Ireland, and a whole lot of other topics next time you and I talk. Very so, good. But thanks so much for coming. As long on. as I write about something that will provide and. Diversions in those yeah, directions. We call it a launch pad. A pretext. Or a, yes, absolutely. a peg. As long as there's something to start with, we can just veer all over the place. Perfect. Perfect. Thank it's you. a date. And that was Robert Emmett Mahar. Go check out his new book, Albert Camus and the Human Crisis, from Pegasus Books. It is out now. Give it a read. I hope I got across how much I enjoyed it. And and how much it has me thinking about Camus' works and, well, and how much of an idiot I was uh, back when I was an undergrad to not take a class with someone who had such passion for an author's work. I really do lament all the opportunities I blew because I was too much of a smart ass back then, but that's youth, I guess. Anyway, Bob's not on social media, which, as we all know, is for the best. Uh, but you should check out his work with veterans and dealing with moral injury at warandmoralinjury.org and moralinjuryandjustwar.org. 
as well as through the collection he co-edited, War and Moral Injury. I'll have links to that as well as a lot of Bob's other books in the show and episode notes for this one. Now, you can support this podcast by um, telling other people about it. Uh, you can also send me a postcard, letter, email, uh, or leave a message on my Google Voice number, which is 973-869-9659. However you reach out, tell me what you like and don't like about the show, who you'd like to hear me record with, what movie or TV show or book or piece of music or theater or art you think I should turn listeners on to. That Google Voice number uh, goes directly to voicemail, so um, you can leave a message up to three minutes long, and you don't have to worry about my picking up partway through and uh, getting stuck in a conversation with me. Now, if you have money to spare, um, I hope you'll help support individuals and institutions in need. Um, there are For individuals, you can go through GoFundMe, uh, Patreon, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, as well as lots of other crowdfunding mechanisms. If you're looking for somewhere to start with institutions or foundations, um, you can always look to your local food bank, the Poor People's Campaign, Freedom Funds, Election Funds. There are a lot of things you can do to, to help work towards a, a better world. So I hope you'll help. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 